Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you. We want to appreciate your holy name. Thank you for gathering us together in this place. Thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Your word says, when brethren remain in unity, you will command a blessing. Lord, we desire to be blessed today. And we want to thank you for our deputy president. We want to thank you for all the leaders that he has come together with. We bless them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We want to pray for this meeting that God, it shall go well. We want to come against any forces of darkness, anything that would want to interrupt this meeting, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We pray for the equipments, we pray for those who are going to speak, that there will be order in this place in the name of Jesus. Thank you for everything that is taking place because you ordered it from the beginning. We bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I will not take a lot of time. I'm going to invite our chair, Honorable Joe Bishop Joe Warui, to present the leaders who will only say their names, and then we'll move on to presentation. Mwishimio Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I want to thank God, our His Excellency, the Deputy President, together with your delegate. We'd like to invite you, uh, welcome you in this place. Uh, we know uh, it's an honor for you to have you here. And I'm sure the people here are excited to see you. Because of time, we, I'm just going to introduce the officials of the UDA in the UK and also in Europe. And since they had a meeting with the Deputy President, I would just request them to stand wherever they are quite fast. We want to ask you, outside there, you can also recruit. If you want to be a UDA member, leave your name, leave your contact. After this meeting, we are going to call for another big meeting, and God bless you so much. Over to you. Thank you, my chairman. So the next phase will be very, very quick presentations, and I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to give the people talking just a single minute. If they take longer, I'm going to kick them very hard. So the first person is Honorable First or past mayor, Councillor Elizabeth Kangethe. One minute, please. Thank you. Your Excellency, Your Excellency, uh, the Deputy President, William Samuel Ruto, and the delegation from Kenya, my colleague Kenyan Samjambo. Hamjambo, we are excited to have you here. And on behalf of the community, we welcome you. And just to tell you that we are here as Kenyans. And as diasporians, for a long time, we felt we've been ignored. We've held meetings, I'm sure you are testimony to that, where we have spoken, where we have aired our grievances, where we have aired what we need as diasporians, only to be left until the next time when there is an election. And we believe this time round, uh, things are working. Now we have registered to vote. After that, we want our voices to be felt. We want to be represented as diasporians. This is what we are asking because uh, we should have somebody who understands diaspora matters. We've got problems like in land and all other issues to do with diaspora. And I believe somebody who has, li has lived here understands this better. So with your governance, I believe this is the time for us as diasporians now to come up and get somebody who will be there for us. Also in terms of education, our children here have gone to school and there is the problem of uh, the, 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 what do you call it? Uh, our children here, because of uh, the nationality here, they are trying to look for jobs, they cannot get jobs because they do not have, they are told they have got your nationality. What are we going to do? And they want to come back. Our children love our country. They want to come and work there, but they are limited and they know Kenya, they love Kenya. Some of us want to come back and do things, but there is that close. So there is a bill that should be carried forward. And I believe the registrars here, Kina Kiman Nishungwa and all the others, can push that for us. So we are really grateful to have you here, and we welcome you and to engage with us. We want that engagement. We want to be involved. We want our voices to be heard. Karibuni sana. 
Thank you, Mayor. You know, it's very difficult to stop uh, a mayor who was in London. But yes, the next person to speak, actually two young people. Where is Agnes Thiongo from Birmingham? Is Agnes here? So Agnes was supposed to be representing the youth, so we'll move on to uh, church and community leaders representative, Reverend Joseph Odima. Thank you, thank you so much. Your Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya and all protocols observed and to everybody else. I, I just kind of thought of this when they asked me to share something and I said, you are the first Deputy President in the new constitution and uh, for that, congratulations. On behalf, thank you. On behalf of the church in the diaspora, we just want to thank God and bless God for your life and for uh, Her Excellency and for whatsoever God has been able to enable you to do for the last eight or nine years going forward. As a church in the diaspora and especially on this side of the planet, our prayer is that God who knows. The Bible says it is the Lord who establishes kings. He's the one who brings people into authority. And uh, we are praying. We have a few more months time from now to get into our elections, which will be on the 9th of the, will be on the 9th of the 8th. And we are trusting, is, am I correct? That's correct, yes. And we are trusting and believing God that the Lord will do whatsoever he is enabled to do. Our prayer for you, are Your Excellency, is that if the Lord brings you into the place as a church, is that the altar will come back. I know I was only told one minute, but can I just say one more minute and then I'll finish up? It's very dangerous to give a preacher a microphone, but because of protocol. The Bible talks about your excellency and you're a preacher. The thing that I love and I heard you speak about that when you are done, when God is done with you, you're going to pick up a microphone and become a preacher. And so we have the first president or deputy president in the Republic of Kenya who is a preacher. Our prayer for you, sir, is as a church in the diaspora is that the Lord will be able to propel you to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm saying this without fear or contradiction. Of course, I know that my last name may betray me. But one thing that I definitely know, one thing that I definitely know, that God is not biased at all. At all. At all. He's the one that elects people. When God was looking for a king, and the children of God were looking for a king, he had to send somebody by the name of Samuel to go into the family of Jesse. Everybody else was there, but then God propelled him. And so it is our prayer, and we pray for you, and we thank God for you. And as a church, as we finish up, we are saying that may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he propel you. May he clear everything. If you believe, say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, your club anthems. Thank you, Reverend. His Excellency, I'm sure you are seeing by now that the Kenya Kwans are here is the total face of Kenya. From Lake Victoria to Mandera, from Turkana to Kuale, we are family behind you, Your Excellency. So the next person to speak is Bishop Clement to represent uh, the business community. Praise God, amen. Amen, I wanna greet all of you in the name of Jesus, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, the Vice President, and the Honorable um, uh, Members of Parliament, Governors, those who are here. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you, especially to UK. Uh, we thank God for your life. We've met before uh, in Moiro's place, and um, I was the man with the, with the, with the Scottish, uh, the one who has anointed you uh, at the Moiro's. Uh, your Excellence, uh, we want to really thank God for your life, and we thank God for everything. Uh, number one, I want to say this on behalf of the church, not just here, throughout the worldwide. Uh, you have been building the altars. You have been supporting the house of God wherever you've been going. I want to let you know that God will not let you down. God will not let you down. And uh, quickly, I want to speak to all the pastors that are here. We have to remember, we have to remember, it is our responsibility to be able to remember when the time of election comes, we have to do what is right. We are covenant people, and we have to do what it takes. Uh, Your Excellence, I wanna, as I stand here, uh, there are two things I want to just talk about. One of them is about, the invest, uh, about investors. Uh, I'm here also to be able to, to represent, uh, uh, I've got um, people that are, uh, are interested, especially with the bottom-up economy. 
Um, we, I've been listening and follow you very well, especially with, uh, uh, especially, thank you, uh, especially with uh, with uh, Mama Mboga and everything. Uh, we I have a team that I have willing to back you up, especially to be able to be able to make sure that Mama Mboga. We have a system because there's a way that you need to be able to make sure Mama Mboga connects uh, with everybody, with the customers, and, and especially with that technology is able to fulfill exactly what bottom-up economy is about. The other thing I want to be able to say here is I want to be able just to thank God for your life. And I, and, and I believe with all my heart, and I want to say this especially though I'm a preacher but also I'm a man of God, I'm talking about here as a businessman, I believe with all my heart, before you go, we, the men of God here in, da in, ba in Diaspora and the women of God, would like to pray for you one more time for the favor of God. So God bless you, and thank you for everybody. Amen. Thank you so much. And, you, and your, your Excellency, there's another special group now that we know that there's some war in Ukraine. We've got quite a number of Kenyans who have moved here to serve uh, in Her Majesty's forces, and they have a representative here, uh, Kilunda, please. Uh, Your Excellency, the Deputy President, members of Parliament, my name is uh, Kisila Mawia, but they know me as Kilunda. I'm a chairman of the 254 HM Forces, members who are serving, and the veterans. Uh, Your Excellency, we just want to let you know that uh, we have a pool of uh, serving members, and they who have left, people who are ready to bring that skills back home. And also, we have a gift we would like to give you. We know you are a very uh, Arsenal fan, so we have... Uh, uh, a jersey here, yeah. Arsenal from the soldiers. Fungua, 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 kapsa, fungua, fungua. Tumeandika pa nyuma, you are hustler, and this is yours. Simatei, this is our founder, please hear what? One minute. Kongoi, karibu, karibu London. Hustler number one. Oh, thank you, Kongoi. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so that the youth do not feel left out. I will ask Janet, because she coordinates quite a number of youths to strictly say something in 30 seconds, literally just one word. Your Excellency and all the delegation, I'm Janet Winaina. I really mentor the young people. And when I say the young people, because the Kenya for tomorrow is actually the young people. Few young people went to Kenya few, uh, over Christmas and they said to me, we want to go back. And a lot of companies in Kenya are hiring from the UK. So what we are requesting the government to do, because we know and we believe you are the leader of the next government, our president is the fifth. What we are saying to you is we would like to invest more in young people. What is going on in Kenya, the lack of order, what is going on in schools? When we look at that now, we're saying there's lack of order with the youth in Kenya and we need to put more investment into the young people. I come from an education background. I've been a teacher in the UK for so many years. And I know when you empower the schools, you've empowered the young people. So I'm calling to you to say, you know what? Let us revamp our school system. And for the young people who are here, I can see you. How are you doing? Yes, I can see the young people here. They are represented. The, the youth who are speaking today, they are coming from Coventry. There's a group of eight youth who are saying, we want to work with the next government. So have them in mind. I invite our SG, who will then invite the chair. So, Dr. Martin Kuhabi, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, the, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, uh, governors who are here, ministers, and also members of parliament, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, Abarizenyu. So um, my role here is to really give you, Your Excellency, just a brief of what the diaspora has been doing and what they've been trying to work on in terms of the issues that you've seen that have arisen. There are a number of things that we've discussed. Some of them were presented to you in December the 3rd, uh, but most have also arisen in the recent times. Uh, my speech here, or rather my presentation, is divided into two. I will look into two things. First of all, there's a wish list, which we wanted to present to you and to elaborate clearly what this wish list looks like. And then secondly, as you always say, mumejipanga ama mujajipanga. 
So tumejipanga, and therefore we want to tell you what we are offering and what we want to do in order to take this uh, agenda that you have forward. I think the first thing which was alluded, Your Excellency, is the issue around the diaspora in terms of the diaspora ministry. And I think most of us agree that the diaspora ministry is a very, very important component. And we believe that that diaspora ministry will be able to assist in terms of making sure that issues, diaspora, issues that are centric to the diaspora are handled accordingly. So therefore, a diaspora ministry, we believe, is useful. But the key challenge is the issues of policies that will be in the ministries and how will that ministry be able to work. So we are here to provide not only the expertise but also the software that is required to drive those ministries. The other issue is the structure of how the diaspora will be structured. We've seen proposals of structures based on County 48, which is very encouraging and we've seen them. We've seen proposals that say the diaspora has to have an agnostic structure that does not favor or actually hinder the progress of diasporians as they are. We have various community leaders, as you've seen, Your Excellency, who are here, and these communities are doing very important work going forward. So therefore, the diaspora structure is one key thing that we really want to look at and see how it is. The other issue is the political invo involvement. How does the diaspora involve themselves in politics? How do we make sure that we are able to contribute effectively to the political agenda of the country? We've had proposals of having a caucus that exists within the lower house or the upper house. That is welcome. But we have a proposal that says it is important that the agenda of Kenya Kwanzaa should look at nominating at least a diasporian into the lower house or the upper house, at least, so that we can have people within the lower house and the upper house who understand diasporian issues and they can, co they can coordinate with the caucus so that the caucus can be more effective. So that is something that we really look at. We are also looking at Article 100 of the Constitution, and I think we'll, we'll try and elaborate on that to see whether, as the diaspora, as a community, could we be fitted into the issue of minority because we are also you know, roughly five million people of us. So that is something that we are looking at. The other issue that we want to really you to be able to take note, uh, Your Excellency, is the issue around our embassies. Our embassies are effective, there's no doubt. Some embassies are very, very effective. But there is one deficiency that is going on within our embassy because when you look at the technology, the use of technology, and COVID exposed our embassies completely because we could not get specific services until you're able to go there physically. Sometimes when you call, you might not even have a call that goes through. So we believe that it is important that we look at the embassies with a view of reviewing the embassies for fit for the 21st century. And it is important that embassies are able to serve us without necessarily having an issue, and they're able to consider us in terms of what we look. And I'll give you an example. If you look at the issues of COVID, and we were told, and I can even quote, that during the election, if we ever had a COVID situation, there was no contingency plan to allow diasporians to vote. That is the fact. So we really feel that there has to be a way that embassies can be able to modernize themselves, embassies can be able to provide consistent service. And I'll also give you an example. If you look at the Swedish embassy, for example, if you go to the Swedish website and look at their embassies in Russia worldwide, it's, it's, it's just consistent. But if you look at our embassies in terms of the website, the information that you get, you might find in some, you are given a permit for pet importation, in some, you don't have this particular permit. So there are all these issues that you get. So that's one thing that we wanted to look at going forward. The other issue, Your Excellency, and I know this is something that I just wanted to summarize very quickly, is the investment. I think it is true that the diasporians pump a lot of money to the country. Last year alone, we pumped 3.78 billion US dollars in the Kenyan economy. 3.78 billion dollars, and that is the highest in 15 years. So just, if you think of those figures, and I know Ichungwa is listening very carefully here, you will find that these figures, Your Excellency, we want a share of controlling how that amount of money is used in our economy. We do not have a way of how that amount of money can be used in the economy. 
So we want to be able to contribute in either investment channels, we contribute in either how these funds are used within the economy, so that we can be able to accelerate some of the issues that are going on in the country. So for example, if there's an investment that is going into schools, investment that is going to, we should be able to decide how that money is being used going into those particular investments. The other issue is the issue around bottom-up economy. We really support you on that, and we have even a better proposal. What we are calling for is the investment channels should be looked at at the county level. So for example, if you have a fisherman who is fishing at a particular part of the world, this fisherman gets fish from the lake, the fish can produce fish oil, the fish can produce buttons for our shirts, the fish can be able, so therefore the added value that goes on to that particular productivity is important. What the diaspora can do, they can invest in those groups that are within those regions that are trying to do those productive work. So that the value add for the bottom-up economy is beneficial to the person who is being served and also the diasporians have a channel of investment. The other issue that we want to look at is the issue around the workforce. And this is something that I want to congratulate, of course, the Kenyan government recently in July 2021 when there was a signed bilateral agreement between the UK government and the Kenyan government in terms of the nurses that we've seen. We congratulate that bit. But the point is, those skilled nurses remain in this particular environment. They do not treat us back at home. So we want a reverse whereby the skill set that you see here, Your Excellency, the skill set that you see here can be used effectively back in our economy. And I'll give you an example. We've got various examples, like for example in Sri Lanka, for example if you go to Sri Lanka, or if you go to these other countries which have diaspora ministry, their own experts are involved in any contractual obligation by the government in order to provide the eyes and the ears that are required. So therefore, you use the diaspora expertise, you benefit the diaspora expertise by having those participating at those particular areas. So Your Excellency, as you can see, we do have a menu of issues that we want to be able to bring on board, but more importantly, we want to be participatory. So therefore, we are coming in to participate. So lastly, you've asked us, what are you doing? What have you done? So we have three points here. One is that we've actually made sure that we are able to assist your campaign, and of course, to make sure that the UDA fraternity and now Kenya Kwanzaa fraternity is able to work through it. We've introduced what we call adopt a volunteer scheme. What that means is that for your own little money, you can be able to help a diasporian, not a diasporian, but you can be able to have a volunteer on the ground to be able to make the phone calls, to move from one point to the other, buy the data bundles. That's why what you see here, Your Excellency, these men and women here have contributed their own part just to attend this meeting to contribute to that particular activity. So we are very keen to make sure that we do that. We had a pledge where Veronica attended and we raised money with the team that is here, roughly about 500,000 Kenya shillings to support that particular event. The other aspect that we are looking at, which we want to take forward, is an issue of looking at the legal issues before the elections. We all agree that the IBC played their part, but there are some specific issues that the IBC, we believe, needs to take control of. We all saw what happened. Good news is that we actually are the highest, what you call, voter poll, that actually got the numbers that were higher within Europe, which is a very good thing. But the point here is that we need to look at what do we do before the election and the cost of elections and so forth. So therefore, we want to take forward those kind of proposals. We'll come forward to let you know how we are doing that. And going forward, we want to do that. Finally, Your Excellency, we here really want to make sure that the UDA and now the Kenya Kwanzaa Fraternity can win. Our key objective, as you saw from Pastor Udima, is to make sure that we pray for you, pray for your team, but more importantly, to win the hearts and minds of Kenyans. Because as 700 of us or 1,000 of us here, we need to win the hearts and minds of Kenyans. So our action, and I want to thank the Fifth Estate, Janet, in your work, 
and others, the community leaders, in terms of what you're doing, in terms of what you're doing. So therefore, we are here to make sure that the hearts and minds of the Kenyans are one, and we want to push that forward. So therefore, we will be embarking with this group here to take that forward. Finally, finally, Your Excellency, Churchill said that it takes courage to stand up and speak. It takes extra courage to sit and listen. And you have walked that path. We wish you the best. Thank you, our SG. And uh, I'll now take this opportunity to welcome our chair. And please, as soon as the chair finishes, can you prepare Toror so that the Yasmin group can present and then we'll be able to pass the, uh, that next phase to our visitors. Chairman, please. Uh, Your Excellency, I know my SG have uh, raised a few issues which are very crucial. Mine, I'm going to divide our issues into three. Number one, we are going to show you the importance of Kenyans in diaspora. Number two, we are going to show you the handcuffs or the barriers we are having. And some of these barriers which I'm going to address them, they are legal issues as a legal person, which I feel they are very, very important for us to be able to be handled now. And if it's now, they will never. Because we know in the past regimes, since we got the independence, that time, I think I was not born, not I think, I know, I was not born. <laughs> the first government, in the first government, I was not born. The second government, the third, the fourth, they have been having engagement anytime they come here in the UK. And we do a, a lot of memos of objects and reasons, but we see nothing. Moment we put, write that letter or we put that memo, you never hear them again. But we want to congratulate you because we can see your heart. We can see through your heart. We can see what is in your heart. And one thing, one thing I know, you are a sincere man. I was reading something, and some one of my friends, the former, uh, the former uh, speaker in the National Assembly, Mr. Farah, there's something he said. We cannot trust the other man. But one thing, with the deputy president, he keeps his word. Oh, yes. That thing, I saw it on the newspaper, and it gave me a lot of strength to continue. So Kenyans in the UK, diasporans, or oh, diaspora is a very special place. And we thank God for according this opportunity for us to vote. Voting is our fundamental right. Article 38, subsection 2 of our Kenyan constitution and article number 83 has given us that right. But since our constitution was promulgated in 2010, we have never gotten this right. And I want to show you how important it's going to be. Your vote, your vote is your voice. Right now we have been given a voice. But is that voice going to speak for us? But there are some handles. And I believe the people we met at Chebukati, I raise all these handles. Our brother uh, 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 Ichungwa is here, Esther Wangohome, they are working constitution. They understand what we are talking about. We have some challenges in our Kenyan constitution. One of the challenge, and that's why sometimes people are laughing at us, that we only manage to register 700 people. Mr. Uh, 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 MP uh, Ichungwa, Honorable Ichungwa, and uh, uh, MP Wahome. We want to say this, and that's why we are saying, one of us, Deputy President, you must give one of us to come and sit and work on the floor of the house. The floor of the house is the house of the law. I listened in America what was going on, and it was discussed that the best way to handle our issues is the current parliamentarian 
the current MPs, the only way they can be able to handle this is having a caucus. Then we are invited into that caucus. Caucus is good, but they cannot be able to work. It can work until I know if I have my sister, if I have my brother who is mistreated in Dubai, who is killed in Dubai, I have someone I can call and they can go and rescue our people. They are dying. Our sisters are dying. Our brothers are dying. And nothing is happening to them. We need someone we can call and say, our member of parliament, take the task, go and rescue our brother and our sister. <laughs> Diaspora is very important. I've been fighting to be a member of parliament since 2013. I was a laughing stock by the people in the UK. Reason why I've been challenging and I want to be in parliament. Article 78, no matter how many degrees we can have, the law prohibits us. We cannot be state officers unless we drop our British citizenship. We cannot be able to drop it. I tell you, there are nations which are accepting dual citizenship. How are we going, Deputy President, to harness this brain? Few years ago, the Kenyan government went to Cuba to get the doctors. Don't we have doctors here in the UK? Who, don't we have the nurses here in the UK? Yes, we need, we need to go home and build the nation together. That's what we need. We need to handle with those laws. Section 22 of the Kenyan, or no, regulation 22 of the Kenyan constitution also prohibit us in conjunction with Article 78. Recently, we were bad to vote with our ID. But we thank God for this gentleman called Omotata. Um, um, Omutata. <laughs> Deputy President, for how long are we going to use activists and we have lawyers in the UK? For how long are we going to use activists and we have people who can, who can, who can, who can take laws, who can, who, 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 uh, who can campaign for laws to be repealed? But thank God, section 37 of our Kenyan constitution, section 37, subsection 5, the law states that we can only use passport to vote. Ha. Huh? Why are you why why is Kenya government accepting ID when opening a bank? But when voting, we can't use our ID. Deputy President, we need legislatures to be in that parliament. We know it is doable. Someone cannot me, it's not doable. Minor commander is a member of parliament, but we don't know on whose status, whether he's a woman representative, but we know he is there. Goodwill, Deputy President, you can give it to us. And the UK, UK, why do we think this thing belongs to us? Meritiously, meritiously, we registered 700 people with handles. Handles were there. There were a lot of handles. Some of the handles, Deputy President, they are in uh, uh, Regulation 34, subsection two, subsection 2. This one talks about the only registration place where you can be able to vote, it is only in the High Commission. How about someone in Scotland? Does he not have right to vote? Someone in Birmingham, don't you have right to vote? Someone in, uh, 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 in Scotland, don't you have right to vote? Someone coming to London only to register. But be assured, our deputy president, the 700 votes, we are putting it in your basket. <laughs> how, are go how, are, how are they going to be translated? And that's what we are saying, people. 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 If all of us, we register. If all of us, we register. We can assure every each person that is here, we can give deputy president 100 votes by influencing our brothers and our sisters back home. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? 
you are having millions from the Kenyans in diaspora. That's why we know we can make it. To finish up, because this is our day, if we leave this place without telling our, our issues, we are going to do injustice into this meeting. We must give and power and vomit everything. Because this is the day the Lord has made. He has made it. I really don't want to dwell in many things. I think for me, I want to dwell on five benefits you are going to get. The moment you incorporate Kenyans in diaspora. Number one, we are going to give you, today in the current legislators, they give us three things. Representation, legislation, and oversight under Article 98 and 99. Is this my, 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 Miss Honorable? 98 and 99, M MP and Senator, right? Yes, they go all the way. Then Article 100, we can get a nomination the same way it was told. Can't we not be a minority group? We can be a minority group. We can be a minority group. These are the benefits as I conclude. If Deputy President, you do it to us here in the UK, we are going to give something we call lorry. And I want to show you something. Can you see this one? Is it here or here? Is it here? Am I touching it? What do you call it? Lorry or Rolly? <laughs> These are four things we are going to give to you. L, legislation. O, oversight. R, representing our people in diaspora. If someone, the land is stolen, we will come after the thieves. We will involve the DCI. How many people are dying because they have bought a land and the time they are going to Kenya, the land was not even sold to them? <laughs> and I, investment, investment. We are coming as legislatures who are going to bring investors. Other legislatures, they, they are given CDF. But for us, we are going to take investment. Deputy President, for our bottom-up economy to work, involve Kenyans in diaspora. As I conclude, <laughs> as I conclude, there are two important salience which we are asking you. We are members of UDA. We are members of Kenya Kwanzaa. And we are praying our mama Esther Wahome. Involve us. Alice Wahome. Alice Wahome. Involve us, mommy. Involve us. Let Kenyans be part of your national executive council. So that we can feel even in Europe, we belong and we belong and that is our home. We want to be there. The second one, where I was slaughtered in 2017, I was slaughtered in the place we called election, uh, 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 election tribunal. The, uh, the, 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 the tribunal that deals with election dispute, no, nomination dispute. Give us money. Let's represent. Let Kenyans be represented in those dispute tribunals so that we can be able to keep our party because they will see the faces they have never seen there before. So our deputy president, together with your people, may God bless you, may God keep you. 2022, the government is yours, and I say it as a servant of God, God is going to give to you. Two things God gave to you. God gave you to, to you two colors. Yellow, represent the glory of God. Uda, Kenya Kwanzaa, shall carry the glory of God. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, green represent resurrection. Our dead economy is going to resurrect. Our dead economy is going to resurrect. God is releasing resurrection to you. May God bless you. May God bless us. And may God keep you our deputy president. Let's keep on praying for him. God bless you. Thank you, Chairman. Put a lawyer to be a bishop.
and it's trouble. It is trouble. But then in our case, it is joy. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, SG, Dr. Martin Koyabe. I will ask the two youth representatives just to stand because Janet spoke on your behalf. Where is Agnes and Mathioya? Just to stand so that the DP can see you. Your time lapsed. I know it was because of the travel, but there's nothing much I can do. <laughs> you have been saved by the DP, so one minute each. And I'll not leave here. Uh, Santi sana bwana Deputy President. Tunashukuru sana kwa kufika kwako. Uh, na nyote pia niwasalimie. I'm just overwhelmed to see him because Abu is the Deputy President. <laughs> yeah, so Sisi, we're just asking for opportunities as the youth to weze kufanya kazi. Most of us, we involve ourselves with um, kama kutuma mizigo nyumbani. So pale kwa pot, kama mambo ineza kuwa raisi kidogo, we'd really appreciate. Uh, tunashukuru sana. Alafu, mungu wa kuongoze kwa safari yako, ukifika huko, kumbuka tu eh, kuempower the youth. We love your bottom-up approach. Tunashukuru sana. Thank you so much as well for this opportunity. Welcome to the UK. Na naitua Mukami of Viongo <laughs> and Wanjiro. And to follow up on your bottom-up strategy for us, it's as, as a Kenyan youth lobbying for the normal Kenyan youth back at home, it's the access, the social mobility issue. So we know everyone who represents the people of Kenya comes with an, with, with a need to distribute opportunities and resources, really the bottom-up uh, strategy. But we know that the issues that come as obstacles, and we know your story, the hustler story, the story of limitations, the story of barriers, what are your policies to face these barriers, the story of access, because we know you have, Tunajua, there's the rule of law, like, but kwa ground is different. You need the right family. You need to come to be born by the right parents. You need the right school. And it, sometimes the school does not cut it either. So what, it, it, what is this that you have that will actually tackle these obstacles? Because everybody has their will. Thank you very much for your time. Asante sana kwa wadogo wetu. Uh, Your Excellency, or His Excellency, I have been disadvantaged because I was made the MC. I also had uh, a very powerful uh, message for you, but let me just hold on to where the chair left. Mine is to praise you, His Excellency. Since uh, a long time ago, we have seen your hand. I would like to testify that I am here in the UK, courtesy of your support. I was a young hustler who was very brilliant and very bright in Kenya, but I couldn't get an opportunity to go out. But due to Harambe, you managed to send me something small that enabled me firstly to go to South Africa, where I became a fellow. And because of that small token, I was able to earn myself a scholarship to come and pursue a PhD here. I enrolled at the University of Surrey and they trusted me. That was in 2006, 2009, I got my PhD, and then they kept me as one of their lecturers. And ever since, I've never got a chance to come back to Kenya. But I believe <laughs> with the Kenya Kwanzaa government, I will be able to run away from this winter after 17 years of torture. And many of these Kenyans, Your Excellency, have really suffered. They don't have opportunities. Our chairman said that he was slaughtered at the nominations tribunal. So he also offered that some of us who are not contesting, we can come and oversee some of those things so that we can ensure that our brothers and sisters like Kanyaru and Olekilelu are not disadvantaged. But we've seen how calm you are. A lot of slack has been thrown at you. If I was you, maybe I would have hanged myself. But His Excellency, you are a strong guy, and I believe you are strong because you are strong for the future of Kenya. I watched you because I'm an ed educationist. When you are uh, the minister or the cabinet secretary for higher education, we used to stay at home for two years after you finish form four. But the only person who did revolution in that ministry was yourself. You ensured that the universities 
or double enrolling, triple enrolling. Now, Egerton University is shut. It's waiting for you to come and save them, and many others. We are watching Kenya very keenly. We know Kenya is safe in your hands because you are not a project of anyone. You are a project of the people of Kenya. When you are a project, you are a puppet. And when you are a puppet, you walk as per the whims of the person that pulls the machinette like this. So we pray that Kenya gets its leader, not a leader that is being pushed to them by the dark forces. We know dark forces exist. But Reverend Hodima, Bishop Margaret Tanui, Bishop uh, Joe, amongst others, you will crush them. You will crush the dark forces. So His Excellency, since I was the MC, I will ask that we demonstrate that we may have left Kenya, that the culture is still with us. And with that, you can be able to see that we have not disconnected. I saw somewhere that uh, the Miguna Migunas are going to go back as soon as you become the president of Kenya. So we are Miguna Migunas here. Many of us are. And therefore, we're looking forward to that day when you are going to raise the Bible and you are going to take that oath. And we know that many, 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 many of us will be on the way home. So, you know, chair here is caring me a little bit. But the, D the DP had requested that we summarize. Can you please summarize what you want to say before I call Yasmin group here? Thank you very much. Um, the chairman of this uh, wonderful team, Secretary General, all the officials uh, of uh, Kenya Kwanzaa Diaspora team in Europe, my colleagues who are here, governors who are here, senators who are here, members of parliament, and other officials who have accompanied me. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Hamjambo. Mambo. Panza, mimi nataka ni chukwe Do I, if I speak Israeli, is that fine? Eh? Eh? Munaelewa mambo hiyo yote, eh? So uh, let me take this opportunity. Maybe there's, I've heard many of you have stayed here for 25 years. Maybe Kiswahili has become a bit of a foreign language. But let me say how grateful I am this evening, together with the, the other leaders who are present here, to um, be hosted by Kenyans in the diaspora Thank you very much for welcoming us. Thank you very much for making all these arrangements. And thank you for coming in large numbers. I have been in many diaspora meetings, but I haven't been one in London as big as this. <clears throat> I want to say to all of you, congratulations. Let me apologize, because the last time I was in London, I failed to appear for the diaspora meeting. I know it was not, uh, it was not funny. <laughs> I, was told, I was told many people were very disappointed. But uh, it was something beyond my control. And I had to attend to some constitutional responsibilities, which uh, I could not avoid. And I didn't do it uh, deliberately. And that is why uh, when I arranged that I would pass by London, I said the first engagement I will have in London is to meet the diaspora. <laughs> so, that, so that I can mitigate to whatever extent uh, what did not happen the last time. So Poleni uh, Sana. Um, there was the diaspora engagement that I wanted to engage uh, with uh, Kenyans who are here. 
and I had also another uh, engagement at the university here. I could, I could not send anybody to the diaspora meeting because it was a meeting between me and Kenyans. But the other one, I could be able to send other people. So let me say to all of you, I am really delighted that we are meeting uh, here this evening as Kenyans, both from home and those of you who live in Europe. Um, let me also congratulate all of you uh, for making it in Europe. We know how difficult it is. We are aware that uh, if you live in Europe, you have to shuttle between two, three jobs to be able to make ends meet. So if there are true hustlers, <laughs> then these are the people in the diaspora. <laughs> I, I was told by the people in, uh, in America that uh, if there is a representation of hustlers, it is them who spend very little time at home and they have to hustle between at least two or three jobs. So um, it is that spirit of working hard and uh, refusing to fail and insisting and persisting until you succeed that represents the true Kenyan spirit. So I want to say to all of you, thank you very much. Um, we don't take it for granted that you are holding our flag very high in Europe. Uh, and I welcome the conversation that we are having, a conversation about how we can be better. We can be better in Europe, and we can be better at home in Kenya. Um, and that conversation is going to enrich the ideas that will go into the formation of the next administration. I am very clear in my mind that uh, nobody has a monopoly of good ideas. We have to listen to one another. And when we said, those of us who are leading the charge in Kenya, that we are going to change the conversation in Kenya, many people did not think it was going to happen. But surely, and very fast, it is happening. We had said three things. Number one, we said we are going to change the conversation. It's not going to be about leaders. It's going to be about the people. Even us having this conversation today here in Europe about the people in the diaspora is part of the success of that conversation. We said the conversation is going to change from that of sharing power and positions. And it's going to be about empowerment of our citizens and creating jobs for those who don't have. Listening to the youth representatives here, we are having that conversation. We are having a conversation about investment. We are having a conversation about how to create jobs so that the people in the diaspora can actually play their rightful role, whether they are here or they are at home. So the conversation is changing. And finally, we said we are going to have a conversation about the economy. And I am very happy that uh, when I saw Pasta say that he is a spiritual leader, but he is going to talk on behalf of the business people. Yeah, he's going to talk about on behalf of the business and the people who want to invest in our country. <laughs> it is a confirmation that we are having the right conversation. And I want to confirm to you that uh, as the Kenya Kwanzaa team, we are going to insist 
that this conversation cannot regress to be about positions and power and, uh, and leaders, that we will insist and persist that this conversation is going to be about the people, is going to be about empowering every citizen of Kenya, and it's going to be about jobs and investment. So, so that's the conversation uh, we're, we're going to have. And let me begin by saying a couple of things so that uh, we understand before I respond to the issues um, that the chair, the SG, and all the other speakers have asked us to respond to. Some of those issues later I will ask uh, my colleagues who are here also to speak to. Uh, some of the issues that you have raised. Number one, good people. Um, uh, all of you know that we have a great country. I am a very solid believer that Kenya is a great country. <laughs> and we have the best country anywhere on earth. Believe you me. Yeah? And we can make it greater. And it's not difficult to make it greater. Let me give you my own experience of, uh, of Kenya and the possibilities that exist in Kenya. Uh, as deputy president, I have walked the journey for nine years. And I have seen how making critical, simple decisions can change the destiny of a nation. When we decided, for example, that we are going to build the SGR, it looked like it was a difficult decision because it's been in government books for 30 years. People have been imagining, when are we going to upgrade our meter gauge railway to a standard gauge railway? In fact, there were like 20 different cases in court that wanted to stop the construction of the SGR. But because we were determined what had been in government books for 30 years. In three years, we had done the first 600 kilometers. Right? And now we have completed to the first 750 kilometers. And it's just a product of decision making. Let me give you another example. When we undertook because uh, the road network in Kenya had huge challenges. President Kibaki had given us an inkling of what can happen. So when we came into office, we decided to launch a program which we, to which we, which we, lab which we named 10,000 kilometer program. It looked over ambitious. Because, why did it look very ambitious? It looked ambitious because from independence to 2013, we had done 11,000 kilometers of tarmac. So if anybody told you that it was possible to do, to double the number of kilometers of tarmac in 10 years, it looked over ambitious. But let me tell you, the good news is that by June this year, which is in four months or three months, we will have actually done 11,000 kilometers of new time. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? I am telling you this to show you the kind of possibilities that are in Kenya. How very fast we can transform our nation. Let me give you another example. 
when we came into office, and, uh, and for your information, how did we achieve the movement from, how did we achieve the 10,000 kilometers of tarmac? We did a very simple uh, decision. We changed the building uh, standards so that we created three different standards of road depending on how much traffic and weight was carried in every road. And that way, with the same resources that we had used before, for one kilometer that we built, we could actually build four kilometers. That's how we managed to drive that exercise. Again, leadership and decision making made the whole difference. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me give you another example. When we came into office in 2013, we had 2.3 million people connected to electricity. 2.3. Today, we have 8.5 million people connected to electricity. How did we do it? We just changed the, con the connection model. And I'm giving you these examples to show you how possible it is to move Kenya to the next level in a very short while. Having achieved what we achieved, eh, it was now necessary for us to move to phase two for the actual takeoff of our nation. And we sat down with experts we crafted what we call the Big Four. And the Big Four was supposed to achieve three things mainly. Number one, it was supposed to sort out what Mokami was talking about, jobs, delivery. It is no longer possible for us as a country to say we are going to grow economy, the economy, and the economy will create jobs. We have to be deliberate about growing that economy in the spaces and in the areas that will create jobs for our young people. And it must be deliberate, right? I once gave an example, and many people thought I was criticizing anybody. I wasn't criticizing anybody. I was just giving an example of what kind of investments do we need to do? Because our challenge in Kenya is that we have four million young people who are out of college, out of uh, university, out of high school, and they have no jobs. So our problem is jobs. So as you invest in whatever programs, in whatever projects, in whatever infrastructure, your eye must be on those that create jobs. Do you understand what I'm saying? So even when you saw in our Big Four plan, you saw there a project called housing. It wasn't so much about the houses. It was actually so much about the jobs. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that, that was the plan. And because when we sat down with experts, they told us that the easiest place to create jobs is to invest in labor-intensive infrastructure programs. And one of them, of the best investment that creates jobs, is housing. For every house you build, you create between five and eight jobs. If we target to create, uh, to do 500,000 houses, we are looking at between three and four million jobs. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that was the target. We targeted also agriculture. And in agriculture, it was about increasing the productivity of our farmers and engaging in value addition, agro-processing, and manufacturing. Because therein not only lie the opportunity to enhance incomes for the majority of Kenyans who are employed in that sector, but by value addition, we enhance 
our opportunity to create additional jobs in that space. And let me give you an example so that you can understand um, where we want to go. I gave an example once. We, we did an investment as government um, in a gun assembly factory in Ruiru. Many of you know Ruiru. So we invested four billion shillings. That factory is a wonderful world-class factory. It employs 100 people. Yeah? Very good paying job, 100 people. But if we had invested the same 4 billion shillings in informal sector manufacturing, let me even put it simply. If we had invested 4 billion shillings in EPZ manufacturing, we would have created 20,000 jobs. How many jobs? We would have created 20,000, the same, the same 4 billion shillings. So the choice, the, the policy choice is if you have 4 billion shillings, do you invest it in a gun assembly factory and create 100 jobs? Or do you invest it in EPZ and create 20,000 jobs? That is the decision we need to make. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, you know, one person asked me the other day in, uh, in D.C., Mr. Deputy President, those decisions look so simple. Why haven't these decisions been made all these years? And I told him, the simple decisions are the most difficult to make. Do you understand? <laughs> And, and it, it's the same thing, you know, you ask yourself, why have we been struggling with electricity connection and yet just by changing the model of connection, we easily moved the connections from 2.3 million to 8.5 million. But it took somebody to make that simple decision. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, the challenge we have in Kenya is not everything else. The challenge we have in Kenya is leadership and decision making. It is as simple as that. It is decision making. The kind of decisions that we make will make the difference as to whether we accelerate our transformation or whether we go at the slow pace we are or whether we even go backwards. So what am I saying? Because I, I, I want you to understand what I'm saying. I am saying, sitting where I have sat as Deputy President, I have seen how effective, simple, concrete, focused decisions can change a nation. I have also seen how simple wrong decisions can also take us backwards. Because after 2017, we had the big four plan, which I've explained to you. But again, we made another simple decision to do something called the handshake. Right? And then it became BBI. And then it became a circus. And then we lost four years. And then the ruling party collapsed. And then the opposition collapsed. And then the big four collapsed. And then we ended up in null and void. <laughs> do, do you understand what I'm saying? You know? And then now we ended up with an economy that is struggling because we've lost four years that we would have leveraged on the investments we have already made 
huge investments we have made in infrastructure by doing the next couple of things. Investments in housing, investments in agriculture, investments in universal health coverage, so that we can leverage on whatever resources we are already put in the economy to build the infrastructure so that we can begin the journey to service our debts. But when we lost time singing reggae, nobody can stop reggae, I don't know, you know, and, and, uh, and, and with a lot of respect, I, I, I really, so sitting where I sit, I can tell you clearly, I can see how making decisions correctly can take us forwards and making the wrong decisions can make us mark time or even go backwards. And that brings uh, uh, me to, to, this, uh, to, to this point where we are. So, good people, we have put together with these good people you see here, we've put together a plan. And I tell you, it is a solid plan. And I can confirm to you from where I sit that it is a practical plan. And we intend to deliver on this plan. We have put it in four categories. Number one, we are going to be deliberate about investments in areas that will create jobs for our young people. That is going to be our priority number one. And we have every reason to prioritize investments in programs and projects that will create jobs. Because the young people of our nation are the biggest asset we have. Educated, talented, creative, hardworking. You can never have that kind of resource anywhere on earth. And how we are going to make that resource either a dividend that takes the country forward or a challenge that takes the country backwards depends on the decisions we will make and the engagements we are going to do with those young people. And we choose as Gwenya Kwanza that our priority number one is to invest in areas including the housing program that we already had identified. And for your information, we had commitments up to four trillion Kenya shillings of people who are ready to partner with us in the housing program. All we needed is an offtake plan. And the members of parliament visit here know that we just needed to, buy, to, to, to get the law passed that gave us the opportunity for an offtake plan. We were so busy doing all the other things that law was not passed, yeah? Because we were busy passing the laws to change the constitution and the rest of the things. I want to tell you, within the first 100 days, we will have the law to provide an offtake plan of the housing uh, agenda that will stimulate the creation of jobs and the, <laughs> and the investments that have already been committed by development partners, investors, including from this country, from the US, and many other parts of the world. That's just one. I've said including housing. Of course, the whole array of uh, informal economic development. Number two, we have said we're going to sort out our micro, small, and medium enterprises. These constitute almost 80% of all the people engaged in business in, in Kenya. They hire close to 15 million Kenyans are in that space of micro, small, and medium enterprise. From 
small scale farmers, to the mamambogas, to all the hustlers in between. And the challenge they face, threefold. Number one, the environment for them to do business. We must get that environment sorted out. We cannot continue to hire people to chase others who are doing business as a scaries. We should actually be organizing credit for them to do business. <laughs> we must get the correct legislation to protect everybody's business. Even hawking is a business in Europe, and it is regulated. There are laws that guide it. Right? It's, not, it's not criminal to be a hawker. All you need to do is to have the right laws so that it is done within the parameters of allowable law. Number three, we have to sort out credit. In fact, that's the elephant in business, in small-scale business. You may want to know that um, many business people in Kenya today, they pay 10% per day to access credit. 10% per day. Many, if you go to any market, if you go to market in Ruai, if you go to the market in uh, Kitengela, if you go to the market in, uh, in, uh, in Kisarian, they will tell you uh, they pay 10% per day. Everybody goes to the market in the morning, they borrow 10,000 shillings. In the evening, they pay 11,000 shillings to the to the to the Shylock, to the fellow who is at the market, which is 10% per day. That is 3,600% per year. While corporate companies have access to credit at 10% per year, Mamamboga is paying 3,600% per year. Do you understand what I'm saying? It looks far-fetched doesn't look reasonable, but that is what happens on the ground. We must sort out access to credit by every business person, including the small person who has no credit record, who has no security to give to a bank, who has no track record in a bank. We must sort out access to credit. If we sort out access to credit, that is the SMEs that today make between a hundred or one dollar and two dollars a day, just by sorting out access to credit, they will move from two dollars to five dollars in a day. Do you understand what I'm saying? Number three. We need to sort out our agriculture, and we have plans on how to sort out our agriculture. We need to sort out our productivity. Let me give you an example how we need to sort out agriculture and how to sort out productivity. I will give you two examples. We are the largest producer of milk in the African continent. We produce five billion liters of milk every year. But on average, we are producing three kilos or three liters per cow. Actually, the same cow, if you feed it differently, you can produce between 15 and 20 kilos per cow. So you can increase 500 percent. Forget about 500 percent. Say even we double. If we just double the milk production, 
and move our production to 10 billion liters. And we export even 3 billion liters. We will move production of milk to the highest foreign exchange earner in our republic. It will overtake tea, it will overtake coffee, it will overtake horticulture. <laughs> hmm? This is the point I was trying to make the other day when it looked like I, was, I, was, I had a problem with the people in DRC. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to say we have a huge market of milk in the African continent, starting with 90 million people in DRC, very hardworking people. We enjoy their music. They can also enjoy our milk. <laughs> That's the point I was just trying to make, only that some, it went off the mark. You know? Isn't it true we enjoy uh, eh? Kanda Bongo Man and all the other people from that corner? Yeah? So, um, that's the point I was, I was trying to make. So what we are saying is we must increase our agricultural productivity. At the moment, if you look at our statistics from Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, we spend 180 billion shillings every year to import food items, which we can produce locally, including importing some of the milk. Do you understand what I'm saying? We still import milk. We're importing maize. We are importing edible oil. We are importing rice. We are importing wheat. Yeah? 180 billion shillings. That tells you that market already exists in Kenya. So we must first invest in increasing the productivity of our farmers so that we even stop importing and feed that market ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? I know you're listening to me and you're wondering. So if things are this simple, why isn't it happening? You know, <laughs> that's, the, that's the question you are asking, you know? But that, that's the dysfunction we have in Kenya. In fact, sometimes when I looked critically at uh, our Big Four plan and how we ended up not implementing the Big Four and we ended up implementing the handshake and the BBI and the reggae, to me, it begins to look like it is actually sabotage, that there are people who do not want Kenya to move forward, that there are people who want Kenya stuck in this conundrum because I don't know it benefits who. Hmm? I mean, that's the only explanation I can, I can have because I, I don't understand how you have a plan here to create jobs. You have a plan here to invest in agriculture and increase the productivity of your farmers. You have a plan here for universal health coverage and all of a sudden it is not a priority. It becomes a priority to change the constitution, to create the position of prime minister and I don't know what, to have another position called ombudsman to undermine the judiciary and to give more power to the president to appoint ministers from parliament and all the rest of it. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying it doesn't make sense. So it can only be that, that there are people whose priorities are different from ours. There are people whose priority is not to create jobs for our young people or to have universal health coverage or to increase the productivity of our farmers. And it can only be sabotage so that we can continue to be, I mean, in this space where so few of us have so much, and the majority of the rest are hustling, you know? So, so this is what we need to address. And many people sometimes ask me, what went wrong? I mean, surely, I mean, 
if you can see very clearly, because I can see from where I sit, I can see very clearly that the priorities are what we had in the big four, to create jobs for young people, to invest in our agriculture, increase the productivity of our farmers, to invest in uh, the right resources so that we can have universal health coverage and lift everybody up. And then all of a sudden, you are told those are not the priorities, the priorities are this. Unless you are mad, you know, you cannot just sit there and think everything is okay. It's not okay. Are we, are we together? So, so really, we have an opportunity to sort out our country. And the decision is going to be made by, among others, the people sitting in this audience. Yeah? The people sitting in, in, in this audience. So I have told you we have the bottom-up economic plan. And I'm going to tell you one more thing, because I know this is something that you will, uh, you, 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 you will appreciate. Because you, you participate in this country, I am sure your pay, your pay slip reflects matters to do with pension and, 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 and the savings you have to make. And it's a percentage of your salary. And that is one area we must get it right. The, the, the issue of long-term savings and the issue of uh, uh, social security. Today, it will not surprise you that um, every Kenyan pays 200 shillings to NSSF for a pension. How much? I'm not saying $200. 200 Kenya shillings. Do you understand what I'm saying? What kind of saving are you going to make, good people? I mean, we're sitting here eh? with 200 shillings. It's a joke, but it's going on in Kenya. The joke is going on in every... <laughs> <laughs> I send our minister for social security to Uganda. In Uganda, the, you pay 10% of your salary. And the government pays 5%. Or is it the other way around? So at least 10% of your salary goes to pension. And it is charged number one on your pay slip. That way, Uganda has built the largest social security fund in East and Central Africa. It is an economy, 30% hours, but they have built social security fund the largest in Eastern Central Africa. And many of you who are asking, how do, we, how do we participate? That's one area we will have to figure out how all of us can participate because the money that we are borrowing, that is now giving us a problem of debt, is savings of other people, including you guys here, because you are saving through the, the laws of this country. And that's the money we are borrowing. And we are paying plus interest to, you, to, to people in Europe and China and all over the place. And we are, we are borrowing everybody's money except ours because we don't have ours to borrow. So the first thing is that we must build a huge fund of our own money for us to be able to borrow to finance our development. <laughs> Do you understand? Let me give you some statistics. China, they save 55% of their GDP. We save in Kenya 7% of our GDP. That's the whole difference. That's why we are borrowing from China. We are borrowing from China because they save. 
And because we don't save, we have nothing to borrow. So we have to go and borrow from. <laughs> so step number one is that the law, we will make sure the law is changed within the past 100 days. Unas <laughs> kiai Yeah, so that even if we agree to 5% of everybody's salary to be saved, we will begin the journey to build a, a huge social security fund that can hold resources that we can use to finance our own development. Tanzania, just across the border, they build their whole Dodoma uh, uh, new parliament, the whole thing, using social security money. Because they also save a percentage of their salary. They don't save 200 shillings like us. Again, I know you are asking yourself, are we really paying 200 shillings every month? Even if you are earning 500,000, they, they deduct 200 shillings. <laughs> <laughs> From the watchman, the fellow who is earning uh, 14,000, 20,000, to the fellow who is earning whatever. Unaona ile ujinga iko Kenya? Yeah, and, and it, it, it wouldn't have been, maybe it would have been funny if it wasn't serious, but <laughs> it is very serious. <laughs> so we need to sort out that space. Again, we have to sort out matters to do with health. Many of you I know, every day, every week, mtupulani yako mgonjwa, tumapesa. We have to sort out that space. And, and it is as simple as this. Uh, when we came into office, let me again give you an example, because I have the benefit of a bit of experience. When we came into office, we had 3.8 million people contributing to NSSF, NHIF, right? And everybody was contributing 340 shillings, or 320, 320 shillings. Everybody, just like the 200 of NSSF. So we decided to say, okay, why don't we adjust so that the people who earn more, like Deputy President, can pay 5,000? Then the other people can be graduated like that. So we changed the regulation, but we were taken to court by a stupid man called Atul. <laughs> I have no regret to say he's a stupid man, because he is. He's a very foolish man. Because he is supposed to be representing the, the lower people. What business does he have defending Deputy President not to pay 5,000? <laughs> <laughs> and those are the people roaming the corridors of power and like giving us lectures. What lecture are you giving us? So, it's very serious, by the way. So we were taken to court. We, I was personally involved because I was driving that program. Finally, we got a, a, a negotiated settlement out of court. Now, the deputy president is paying 1,700, uh, I think, and a few coins. While Mamamboga is paying 500. So Mamamboga, whose income is 5,000 shillings, is paying 500 shillings, which is 10% of high income. Deputy President, who is earning a million shillings, is paying 1,700. So, there is a problem. Because honestly, 
I mean, the people at the bottom of the pyramid are carrying a heavy load than the people on top of the pyramid, you know? And somebody wants to tell us it is fair. It is not fair. It is not fair. It is not right. It's not even moral. Do you understand what we are saying? So we decided in uh, 2017 that we are going to sort out that challenge. But unfortunately, again, we became busy. Passed the law this year, which we were supposed to have passed in 2017, immediately after the election. We passed just the law the other day, and we are now in the process of trying to implement it. Right? If everybody paid a percentage, even if it is 1%, even if I paid 1%, I would pay at least 10,000 shillings. And you, I would pay 10,000. And the people earning more money would pay more. And I'm telling you, when we just change from, one, uh, from the 340, the 320, to 1,700, we moved our collection from 900 million shillings every month to about 3.3 billion shillings every month. Today, we are collecting just under 60 billion shillings every year from NHIS. If we made everybody pay a, a percentage of what they earn, we would actually collect anywhere between 170 or 200 billion Kenya shillings and we would wipe out the whole issue of health insurance in Kenya. Everybody, including those who cannot afford, we would be able to put them on NHIS. Yes. And I am telling you this out of experience. I am not talking hot air. Because when we made the decision to change the connection of electricity, it looked far-fetched. Today, we have results. From 2 million people, we have 8.5 million people. So I, that's why I was telling you, I have the benefit of knowing what works and how we can change this country fast. So that is why this election, is very important to all of us. It is the election that will make us go forward or an election that is going to make us stuck in the same place. Do you understand? Our competitors on the other side, they are telling us that their first priority is to come and restart the reggae. You know? That's what we are being told by Mze Tinga. You know, really, there's a problem in Kenya. You know, with a lot of respect, I don't think the candidate on the other side has the capacity to run a country. I'm telling you. I mean, if, if you are standing somewhere and you are making a state and you are making a statement or you are addressing people and you can't even remember what you are saying how will you run a country how will you run a country you know we have to be serious we have to really be serious as kenyans you know we have to stop these jokes it, it is not funny <laughs> it is not funny but anyway that's where we are. So let me tell you and persuade you that the team you see here, we have a plan for our nation. And we are asking you to, <clears throat> we are asking you to give us a chance to move Kenya to the next level.
Yeah, we're asking you to give us a chance to move Kenya to the next level. Uh, and I want to promise you that we will not let you down. We will do our best and we will work hard and we will deal with all the issues that require us to be dealt with. Let me conclude by saying the one thing that uh, is also very important because when you're dealing with public resources, accountability is very important. Making sure that every coin and every cent and every shilling goes to the intended purpose and that there is sufficient oversight and there is clear accountability mechanisms as part of our plan we are going to do three things. Number one, because accountability is at the heart of the performance of any government. Number one, we are going to make sure that the criminal justice system and the judiciary have the constitutional independence, that is provided for in the Constitution, but they also have the operational and financial independence for them to be viable vehicles of fighting corruption, of making sure that all disputes are settled in good time, and of dispensing justice in good time, because justice delayed is justice denied. <clears throat> How are we going to do it? Number one, today, the Inspector General of Police, the DCI, the whole criminal justice system doesn't have financial independence because their budget is controlled by the office of the president. And it is said, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Two, the Constitution provides that those institutions which are independent, including the IG, the DCI, and everybody else, must have their own independent budget and their own independent accounting officers. We are going to move the appointing, uh, the, the accounting officer from the office of the president to the IG's office so that they can operate independently <laughs> of any office and be able to run the criminal justice independently of the executive. You understand what I'm saying? So that nobody is telling them, go charge so-and-so, leave so-and-so, go charge so-and-so. That one is, uh, belongs to the handshake, so don't charge him. Uh, charge that one. Because he's the one controlling the resources to, 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 to the investigating uh, agencies. Number two, the Constitution provides that we have a judiciary fund that has not been operationalized the 10 years we've run our new Constitution. We will operationalize the judiciary fund day one so that the judiciary have the resources to make sure they hire enough judges, they have enough software, they have enough hardware, whether it's buildings or whatever, so that they can dispense justice by giving them financial independence. Today, the judiciary is getting half the money the Constitution says they should have. And the Chungwa will tell you it is deliberate to slow down the judiciary. And so that Somebody can call the shots and tell the judiciary, uh, if you do this and this, we will add you an extra one billion. You must stop that nonsense. You know, let the judiciary be. In fact, I remember one statement uh, Willie Mutunga, our former chief justice, made when he was retiring. On the day he was leaving office, he said one fundamental statement. He said he was very happy that during the tenure of President Kibaki, the hotline never rang. 
the line that normally the president uses to call. It never rang one day for four years. And he was very happy that it never rang. You know? Who knows? I don't know whether it rings nowadays. I, I, <laughs> Maybe we will ask the Chief Justice who is there whether it drinks or it does not. At least Mutunga said it never rang. Are we together? Because there is absolutely no reason why anybody can tell the judiciary what to do. And it is brazen and the worst kind of impunity that anybody can imagine that we can change the Constitution so that the president can have leverage to appoint an ombudsman reporting to him to supervise the judiciary. That is impunity of the worst type. I mean, surely. I mean, the president has enough power already, too much power. Why do you need power over the judiciary? Why do you need power over the legislature? And if anybody is not satisfied with the powers the president has at the moment, it's not necessary for you to run for president. It's not a must. <laughs> so, this is what I am saying. And um, let me, I know I have talked for long, but uh, maybe I am talking for the, the, the one I was supposed to come and this one. <laughs> Let me respond to the issues. Uh, I hope I am clear on, on what I have said. Let me talk on the issues the uh, chairman has, has talked about. Number one, I agree with you that uh, we need to up our game in terms of the quality of service between our embassies and Kenyans in the diaspora. We, we, we certainly need, there is some room there for us to improve on, on, on the quality of service that's available to Kenyans in the diaspora, number one. Number two, we cannot have an economic conversation or a, 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 a conversation on the economy in Kenya without the diaspora. Because your contribution is about almost 400 billion Kenya shillings that you send to Kenya every year. And that counts for something. And therefore, your issues are legitimate. Number one, we need to assist you so that the resources you send home work for you and work for the country. We must have packages in, in three areas. We need to sort out first the health issues. Once we have clarity on delivery of quality health and we have sorted out the matters of NHIF, instead of you guys sending money for this person who is sick and this person who is sick, we will now make it possible for you to pay a reasonable amount and buy insurance for your folks at home. You don't have to be called at night that so-and-so is sick. <laughs> insurance should be able to take care of that. So that if you are paying a thousand shillings or 500 shillings per month to get insurance for your mom or your brother or your cousin, you know that once you are paid that a thousand shillings, Kenya shillings a month, Nobody will call you because they will have a functioning uh, health insurance. And as and when uh, it is required, the, the insurance co uh, coverage will sort out their bills. That is one way we can assist you so that you have predictable mechanisms of how you can support your folks at home without necessarily being you know, push left, right, and center. That's number one. Number two, many of you send money home to build this house and that house, and we all know the stories. 
that uh, somebody is taking pictures of somebody else building, <laughs> <laughs> building whatever it is they are building, or they are building their own house and they are taking pictures and telling you it is your house, and, uh, and you end up knowing that that was all a story. In our housing program, it will be possible for you to buy a flat or a house in Kenya, like all other Kenyans, which nobody is going to cheat you, you know? You will not be in, involved in buying cement and buying Jui this and the other and then somebody. So you can actually buy a property and we can make it possible for the diaspora to specifically, because of the contribution you make, to uh, specifically have a quota for the diaspora people to buy certain packages. <laughs> and if there are some concessions to be made, which we can then agree on, then it will be on such packages. That if you buy a house, you will get this kind of rebate or you will get this kind of uh, discount or something like that. Are we together? Or waiver of something. Are we together? Clear packages of so that you can buy real estate without struggling with your cousin or somebody who is telling you, send more money, cement has gone up, I don't know, the fundi did what, and the other story went the other way. Are we together? Number three, today in Kenya, 50% of our borrowing is local borrowing. That local borrowing today is actually the biggest beneficiaries are Kenyan banks. In fact, almost 80%, maybe even 90% of borrowing by government, we are borrowing from, from banks. And banks are making billions of shillings. We tried to reorganize so that ordinary people can borrow, can, can actually lend to government. Because government is paying seven, eight, nine percent, you know? Yet, if you uh, go and deposit money in the bank, they will give you one percent. But they are uh, lending it to us as government at nine percent. Do you understand? Same Kenyans, Kenyans in Kenya, when you go and deposit money in the bank, they will give you one percent, maybe two, if you are lucky. But they are lending it to government at 8%. We try to organize so that even ordinary people can lend 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 to government using government bonds. But the banks frustrated it because they brought a lot of manenos. We will now make it possible for you guys in diaspora, instead of giving keeping your money in the bank here and earning negative interest. We can give you 7% interest at home. Yeah? By having a diaspora bond where you guys can put in your money. You will, number one, assist us with money to run our development program, but you will also benefit by paying you the interest that we are paying banks. We are paying banks. Why don't we pay hardworking people like yourself and other ordinary Kenyans at home? Do you understand? That's the third uh, issue I wanted to say. The fourth issue is what I said about uh, social um, security fund. You too can contribute your retirement package to Kenya. As we increase the 200 shillings we are paying to a percentage of our salary, you too can benefit in that. So that even as you work hard here, when time is up, you can go back home to a, a retirement package that gives you a living uh, income as you, as you grow old. Isn't you? Back at home. So uh, that, that, that can also be worked out. The fifth issue is the issue of uh, 
you people participating in voting. If there is one right that you cannot give away, is the right to vote. Because you decide how ta your taxes are used, you decide whether your children go to, go to school or not, whether there is medicine in your hospital or not. So it is a fundamental right. And the opportunity to participate in elections is a very critical opportunity. That's why we've been pushing the IBC to make sure that Kenyans in the diaspora have an opportunity to vote. We started five years ago with a few, with I think five countries. Now we've gone to 12, including the UK. So for the very first time, although we have only 700 people, they will have an opportunity to vote. I, however, agree with you that the interpretation that IEBC gave to the law was the wrong interpretation. Because the law said that Kenyans in every country where we have a mission will have an opportunity to vote. But the IEBC narrowed it to say in every country where they no, no, no. Uh, they, they they reduced it to the to the embassy and consulate only. You know, it can, it cannot be like that. It means if we have an embassy in the UK, then then it must be it must be made possible for everybody in the UK to vote. You know, it it, it, it cannot be that it is just at the embassy or at the high commission. It cannot, it, that's, a very, that's a very narrow interpretation of, of the law. So again, I think policymakers who are here, we have members of parliament here, so Ipan is here, Adagala is here, you people must take up this, uh, this, this challenge and we see how we can work with IEBC to make sure that, uh, I know they will come up with resources and, and things like those, but those are things that can be worked out so that we can give opportunity for uh, Kenyans in the diaspora to vote. Um, on matters to do with whether we can appoint somebody from, or nominate somebody from the diaspora into the Senate or National Assembly, it's a very positive, uh, you know, idea. And for your information, uh, we already have people in who are members of diaspora already nominated. In fact, I remember we nominated a lady called Falhada, who was actually, in fact, her children are still here. And I think I even met the sister here. Who your sister was Falhada? And you know that one there. So Falhada is a member of the Senate. And we, we nominated her, and she has been pushing to the extent that she can the diaspora agenda. But um, maybe we need to contextualize it better uh, so that um, whoever, uh, whether it is Falhada or the next person can actually find a way of making sure that, uh, you know, the problem is that parliament is in Kenya. So, and when somebody leaves here and goes to attend parliament, then I think they stop being diaspora or something. <laughs> because <laughs> even, in that, even in that parliament, for your information, the members of the diaspora, I think maybe 10 or 20% of parliament is made of people from diaspora. All these people. Susan Kihika there was in the U.S. for 20 years. <laughs> she's, she's now a member of the Senate. So Ipan here was in the U.S. Uh, Owen Bayer here was in the U.S. Today they are members of parliament in, in Kenya. But they are not prosecuting the diaspora agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So maybe they are prosecuting it. Maybe, I, I, I don't know. 
Kipchumba Murko Mandea is a member of the diaspora. He was in the US for donkey year. So uh, I don't know. We need to rethink the whole of that space so that we can structure it better and drive the diaspora agenda properly. There is the suggestion that we have a caucus. There is even the suggestion we have a committee, like all the other committees in parliament. We actually have a specific committee. I think it was actually that recommendation was made by Kipchumba Murkome, that uh, we have a, 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 a specific committee that discusses matters to do with diaspora in parliament. I think that's another. But you know, we are having a, a very healthy conversation. I mean, it's just people are now beginning to think of ideas on how we can bring the diaspora agenda into the mix, right? And, and we need to have that conversation. I hear you when you say maybe even we can nominate people under the category of minorities. You can't qualify to be minorities because you are about three million. Minorities are like okay, they are like 500 people. <laughs> we, we need to rethink of, you know, how do we, how, how do we, uh, how do we, eh? maybe we have, we just have a commander of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so I, I think this is what, this is the conversation we need to have, eh? And we need to have a back and forth so that we can have a middle ground and see how best do we take it forward. And I, I think there are leaders here who are listening, and uh, we will all uh, share our thoughts. And uh, what you are doing, you're also provoking us to think, you know, which, which, is, a very, which is a very positive thing. And finally, mm, mm, yeah, uh, matters to do with citizenship. Uh, first, I know many people, in fact, that's what we were being told in the US, many people are traveling eight hours to go and renew their passport. I think with the, in the era of ICT, surely, we can renew a passport much more easily without, without really having to travel all this way. Either even if we need fingerprints, we can have a mobile kit, you know, which can go around every, you know, every second week it is in Newcastle, every, you know, is in the other place, so that we can make it that much more easy for citizens in the diaspora to access services instead of them having to travel long hours to be able to access them. So. Again, we need to have a conversation there about the delivery of uh, consular services by our embassies and leveraging on ICT to a good extent so that we can get most of those services online and we can be able to uh, make it much more efficient. I think those are the issues. Um, on the issue of, uh, um, what was that, that issue? Citizenship in terms of? Dual citizenship is also already guaranteed by the Constitution. The only problem is that uh, I think there are restrictions on, on being a state of star. Uh, and there were arguments, you know, when we went through the process in BOMAS, there were very serious arguments that went into the Constitution making. It will require a constitutional amendment for us to reverse that. And uh, it is a very slippery road, because if you go the direction of changing the Constitution, it's quite a long shot. And uh, ordinary Kenyans are the majority. They will say, those people who are already uh, enjoying themselves in Europe, why do they want to come and crowd us out of this place? <laughs> so, they will, you know, you know the, the, the ordinary argument you know, in Kenya, they will not understand. They will say, why, what is wrong? So anyway, so we, but it's a discussion we can, we can have. Cindy, um, so, so again, I think those are the issues. Let me not exhaust 
uh, we have very capable leaders here. I also want them to, to speak to us briefly. And if there is anything, uh, good people that I haven't uh, responded to, uh, everybody uh, uh, can respond, including matters to do with NEC. Maybe Alice can respond and, and other people. So again, let me say how grateful I am. Thank you very much for welcoming us to London. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Asante, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, all the time you have taken to listen to me. I know you're busy people, and uh, I've taken a while. And uh, it's just because I, I thought it was necessary for us to be um, at the same level. I will answer one or two questions if need be. But before, let me see whether some of those questions can be answered by my colleagues who are here. I will start again with uh, Kemani Shungwa. Santa Sana, Your Excellency, what to a UK hamjambu? Niliskia harambe. Mugo kwa network. Asante Sana. I think I'll try and be very brief. But may, let me just maybe begin with uh, attempting to answer one of the questions or one of the issues that are of concern. And just to reiterate what His Excellency has said that indeed the debt burden that our country bears today is one of the areas that people in the diaspora, by investing back home, you can help our country to deal with, be it in NSSF or even in what His Excellency proposes a diaspora bond. The euro bond that you hear about and you hear the CES finance has come on a euro tour, uh, a roadshow for the euro bond is basically money that is borrowed from the money you're investing in pension funds here. Therefore, it's possible for you to invest in pension funds back home, and we are able to access that money from our domestic market, and we stop government from crowding out the private sector from the domestic market, and therefore we are able to grow our economy better. I think that His Excellency has said that it is simple solutions to what seem to be very complex problems. And maybe you are there asking yourself, why is it then that he has been deputy president for nine years and he has not been able to offer those simple solutions besides the ones he has mentioned? And always my answer has been simple, that it is out of sheer incompetence in the highest level of leadership in our country, sheer incompetence, laden with state capture, and of course, overridden by political pettiness. It is political pettiness that when Kenyans are looking at investment opportunities, you shut down an industry that is employing over 5,000 people in Thika out of political pettiness. It is political pettiness and state capture when you see an industry built from the sweat of a hustling Kenyan family, Tabi the Karanja's Karocha company in Naivasha, today is being shut down because you want to bring a Danish company to come and brew beer in a private farm in Naivasha. That is state capture. It is that state capture, political pettiness, and sheer incompetence. And the lack of leaders that will make those simple, bold decisions. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, here, we have a leader in Kenya Kwanzaa with a team that is ready and bold enough to make those very simple decisions to move our country forward. Mimi, mimi ni tawaomba tu, tushirikiane, muendele kutuombea, tukiuziwa uoga ama tukipo ya bure, tusinunue na tusijukue hata ya bure. Sindio?
hiyo uh, mashamba wacha tuongeze kuingine sababu nasikia hata hapa waligawiwa manyumba sijui na mashamba hapa na wenye waliwapea mashamba yetu huko Kenya si ni kweli lakini wacha nikome, nikome hapo niwaambie tunawapenda sana na tafadhali all those who are registered as voters vote for William Ruto and Kenya Kwanza do what i had people in the us tell us they are doing in your contribution just from where you are talk to as many kenyans as you can talk to back home to be able to support this team to move our country forward kwa hiyo mengi mungu awabariki asante sana let me ask uh, soipan tuya member from narok um good evening brothers and sisters i'm really happy to be here and it's very interesting the power of the village to see arungu wilding masai in, in london <laughs> um thank you excellency i think you've said a lot that uh, we could all say but i just want to tell our brothers here that i, I don't think there could be any bigger demonstration of uh, commitment from a presidential candidate like we see here with our deputy president you know what is going on at home and if this was not important he could not be here so that this is a true demonstration that uh, the things we are talking about here are dear to the heart of Kenya Kwanza uh your excellency um i i would suggest that uh, you know the exercise that is going on back home where we are working on uh, charters for different regions in the country the coastal region western region you know rift valley we really must have a charter for the diaspora <laughs> with the uh, you know measurable actions that uh, will actually be realized once you get into power that is when not if when you're there so i think that should be a challenge to to the diaspora leadership that uh, we begin that process to concretize some of the things we are talking about here uh for actualization um you know Your Excellency the, the housing um idea or the one that was derailed by the handshake and all these other side shows these are the investors yeah who would come back home you know and uh, I just want to say to you uh, our brothers here that nothing takes away your rights just because you have chosen to move to another country to do your thing your political rights are intact your social rights are intact economic rights intact and i think that is the assurance that we are getting here today from uh, his excellency the deputy president so i will not uh take much more time but just to say for us the the, the members of parliament both senate and national assembly some of these things and and as i say you know your rights in article 37 38 of the constitution you need to actualize and it's a challenge to you people that uh, you know take take your space to participate in the ongoings of parliament bring your petitions with issues that must be addressed because you are kenyans and your rights are intact and no one should interfere with them and we are here you know with the talk of a diaspora committee a diaspora ministry uh these are things that will be actualized so in the interest of time thank you very much tupeleke salamu nyumbani asante asanteni mimi natoka naro uh mubarikiwe sana asante asante let me ask bitris adagala all the way from figiga Uh, thank you your excellency and the people of the diaspora 
Ah, nusu ya kuonana. Situsalamiane. Bwana Yesu nasifiwe. Hebu nione wale wanasema kura tarehe tisa mwezi wa nane ni ya Kenya kwanza. Mko tayari? Ah, thank you Bwana Excellence. Your Excellence. You can see we have sure votes here in the diaspora. Uh, for those who may not know me, I'm Adagala Beatrice, woman MP Vega County. And I'm delighted to be here. And I've seen we have strong votes in the diaspora. We are assured these are our votes, Your Excellence. And your concerns have been taken carefully and clearly. And if you want to know a government that is valuing women, it is this government of Kenya Kwanza. If you want to know a government that is valuing youth and people living with disability, it is this government that you are going to install in August. And we want to assure you, as Kenyans living in the, in the diaspora, your concerns will be handled and will be worked on very much with the people who are alert, sound mind, and not the Mugabe who is always asleep when issues are being discussed. <laughs> so rest assured, in this coming government, we have very young minds, strong women and men, who are ready to steer the nation of Kenya to a better level. There have been concerns here. Money goes to Kenya, you remit a lot of money. With no proper structures, with no proper plans, you know everything goes to drain. And that's why Kenyans are always crying of Fruliza. With this new coming government, the question of Fruliza will no longer be there. The economy is going to grow to a level that Kenya has never experienced before. And we are very certain it is going to happen. The issue of bills, Fululiza have talked about it, bills, paying bills in, in your home areas, with this coming government, the issue of health care will be taken care of and all will be well. I feel like uh, getting, uh, I'm a preacher, man. I feel like preaching it. I feel like saying hallelujah. Nambarikiwe sana. Nipeleke salamu nyumbani. I'm very happy nimepata watu wangu wa vihiga hapa. Na nyinyi ukule nyumbani mpige simu museme mama arudi tano ten. Asante sana mama Beatrice. Thank you. That gentleman is called Owen Bayer. MP from Kilipi North. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. My name, like you've heard, is Owen Bayer, MP for Kilifi North, and Mimi Pia Nimeishi Uhuku. And uh, I know what hustling is in these countries. Nini, you are the best example of hustlers. I know I lived in Germany for some time, and I know guys who do four jobs. Wanaka kwa nyumba masamawili, iyo masaingine yote, ni kazi. Na hiyo pesa yote, almost a quarter, of, a three quarters of it, anapeleka nyumbani. Na kama kule nyumbani mambo ni mbaya, hata ye mambo yake ni mbaya. That's why it is your duty to ensure that we put a government in the country that is responsible, that works, and that brings the economy up. It is your duty. So that the, the hard work that you put in here to make the money Ikifika kule nyumbani, it has value. So that we have policies that protect the people that you love. Because wale sindio wapendwa wenu. And that's why you are here. So also it is your responsibility to also tell them how to vote kule nyumbani. So that we put a government that really has the heart of the people of Kenya at the center of it. But more importantly, I also want to say... Uh, that as you stay here and as you work here, also invest back home. I know there is a, the north of Malindi, there's something that is coming up, a diaspora city, 
where members from the diaspora are contributing money and establishing a city there. That's a, a huge economic investment. I've talked to the chairman and he keeps on talking to me about how we should help them get the land, secure the land and all that. Don't be left out. I think the chairman lives in Ohio, something like that. It's, it's also important that you be part of it. There's even another seat in Kikambala that is also being done by people from the diaspora. I attended the groundbreaking of that seat. It is being done by people from the diaspora. There's a lot of investment that are going on. And if you feel that ukipeleka ndugu yako pesa, hiyo nyumba itajengwa kwa hewa, you can actually join these other schemes so that you can actually develop um, uh, the country. Not just pesa ya kupeleka watu hospitali peke yake, but ukipeleka hiyo nyumba ikijenga huko, you employ five, six people who are building and constructing the house. You're actually contributing to the GDP and growth of of that country. But I also want to add something that uh, the Deputy President uh, said. I think in our plan, we are moving from just building infrastructure to productivity. I think you, if you listen to him carefully, you saw that he's actually moving towards a productive, a more productive economy. Productivity in terms of agriculture, productivity in terms of growing the economy of the country. And uh, that's what you also need to invest in. Because he's saying, let's look at a cow that produces more than 15 liters. So what are you doing about it? He's saying, let's look at coffee bush that is producing more than 20 kilos. What are we doing about it in terms of our investment as diaspora so that we can actually uh, not just tap in, but also help him in his plan to grow the economy and increase productivity in the country. I thank you. I wish you all the best. God bless you. And ikifika tarehe tisa mwezi wa nane, mpige ile kura, sasa kama tunengia state house, tunengia wote. Asante ni sana, thank you. I will ask Alice Wahome, member of parliament from Kandara. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We shouldn't really be speaking because you started and you've done a very, very major contribution in terms of your participation today. You've covered broadly all the issues, many issues, maybe not all, but many issues. But you know, And you know, Your Excellency, within the League of Fraternity, uh, there is uh, many, many times lawyers you will say, when the subject has been fully covered, I have nothing useful to add. <laughs> but, but for purposes of remaining relevant, and consistent, because these people know me as, uh, as somebody who has something to say. I want to just add on the question of um, this guy here, seated here, speaking that he has a plan. And he says his team and himself, they have a plan. Meaning you are now part of the team. Don't see yourselves as outside the the team and the plan. It is your contributions that will make this plan work and carry on board those beautiful ideas that you have. And therefore, I want to encourage even written memorandums because tonight may not be exhaustive enough. Uh, he has been called names. He has been given big shambas everywhere in the country. They speak of Western, you have heard of those. They have smeared his uh, character in very demeaning manner. But you know what? The spirit and the metal remains the same every day. And therefore, we also need to encourage His Excellency because he's the bearer of our dream. Those people are no longer the bearers of our dreams. And I... I want to say that I'm part of that dream. And we, we have heard you talking about legislative interventions, policy interventions, administrative interventions as members of parliament. There is a role that we can play. But I can tell you, between now and elections, the, nothing much can happen. The, the, these people ha have designed to work on BBIs. You know, even now they are waiting for something possibly to come from the Supreme Court. But if we are determined the way we are, 
that is a sideshow as far as we are concerned. So I want to say that William Ruto is the president that we are looking for ourselves. <laughs> the, the other thing I want to say is that uh, there is, uh, the chairman raised the question of uh, the NEC participating in the party affairs, party organs. None of us here, when you are a, a, a candidate or an aspirant, you cannot be in the, according to our constitution, you can't hold an office. But, and we haven't done any elections because, you know, UDA is less than a year old. I think now we are going to our 10th month and we shall be doing our elections. The, you are in touch with our SG. She's very effective in our secretariat. So I want to urge you to follow up on the activities of the party. After the general elections, we will be going into uh, grassroots elections because you know, our gra if you look at our constitution, the party structures uh, start at the polling station. Maybe we will think of how to have a polling station in the polling stations in diaspora because if we are voting here, then we need to have those structures of the party right from here. So there will be time to participate in those other activities. You, there is also diaspora uh, provisions in our constitution. Take advantage of that, read through, and see how you can participate in the party issues. May I say that um, we the dream may have been interfered with, but we have not lost hope. You have heard uh, these people trying to imagine that Mount Kenya vote is, uh, is going to be taken to a market by one individual. And you know that, who is that individual. So you know, we have said no. The vote of the individual will be cast by the individual. We have done sufficient support to the individual, that person, 10 years. We are now looking forward for another 10 years. And the Mulima vote will definitely make history, go down in history as that vote that decided that Atupangwingwi. <laughs> so I don't want to say more than that. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for even making it here. These people, I have been here before mobilizing for some other party a long time ago. I was trying to see whether I can see the old networks. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and I hope that uh, you carry on. You know, sometimes you could start a good thing and then not, fuel, you know, not, not carry it forward ensure that the structure and the UDA family and the Kenyan family is strong. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Alice. Let me ask uh, Susan Kehika, the Senator of Nakuru. Thank you. Thank you. Asante, Your Excellency. I know you told me to talk like that, but ulinikosea kidogo. Ulisema ni meka America miaka ishirini. Na mimi, I'm trying to look like a 28-year-old. Sasa, she died up. So anyway, we are very, I'm very, very delighted to be here tonight. And even, unajua for us ladies both, eh? No, anyway, anyway, anyway. No, no, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here tonight. Actually, about... Back in 92, how old is that? How long ago is that? Woo, okay. I was in London. I started out schooling in London before I moved. Oh my gosh, that's worse, boss. I messed up, Kidogo. But I was never good in math. So I know, I know from where you're sitting, I get it. I then went over there across to the US and continued my many years. So very briefly, because I know we don't have time. Mine, I'll speak a bit more, Chairman, more, more specifically on my experience a bit. Janet, you're my friend on Facebook. Former mayor to Likuwa Nawewe US some time back. So when I look in here, Kanieru, back there in Joro, uh, I, I know. <laughs> so anyway, when I look in the room, I know so many of you. And I just wanted to say that for myself, uh, my journey has been a bit different, Kidogo, but I wanted to talk to you, to, to, to talk to that because of you, Chairman. I also one day woke up and decided that I wanted to move back to Kenya and uh, take a dive into this difficult, crazy field of politics. Let me call it that way, because it's a bit difficult. 
And um, at the time, the reason that I decided to go back when I went back is because the new constitution had just come into place and I felt that maybe there was better room even for women, so to speak. So I left my law practice then and I decided to hop on a plane about 14,000 kilometers back to Kenya with my two little girls and go figure this thing out. So talking to you about maybe perhaps sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith. And initially also, I didn't get it, because I went and I always tell people, sometimes it's nice to be ignorant. I know that sounds crazy. Because if I knew what I know now, I probably would not have been brave enough to even try and do it. Because I went there and it was six months to the elections. Can you imagine? Like you can't be here if it's six months to the elections. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but it's, it's just gonna be difficult. Because people start campaigning many years before, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you know it's the truth. So if you're seeking a seat in these elections, you need to be home. You need to be in the ground. You need to be in the villages. I would go to some places because then I, I had decided to run for a seat in Bahati. And Bahati borders, and I'm talking very fast, boss. Bahati borders Nakuru Town East constituency. And I would go in and I would talk and I would tell them what I'll do. And then I finish and I get out and somebody, and you do what you're supposed to do. You know, hapo. Kanyaru, I know you know. And then nikitoka hapo, nasikia mtu ananiambia hapo watu haikuwa Bahati. Iyo ilikuwa Nakuru Town East. Because <laughs> I had been gone from Kenya about over 20 years, yeah? So, and I look back, and honestly, and in all honesty, and no offense, guys, I look back and I'm like, honestly, I should not have been a choice. Because <laughs> I know I went to one meeting and they're like, so what are you going to do? And then I was telling them about this uh, community policing and everybody's looking at me like, what? You know, like, I just, yeah, I, I, I just didn't get it, yeah? So, but saying all that to say, then I didn't make it, I, I did not make it. I had spent all the money that I had come with. I had my two girls looking at me and asking me, why would you bring us here when you told us that your dad took you to America so you can study, but you have taken away that opportunity for us and you have brought it us here and now you are done. So I put my furniture on, there is a diaspora like uh, expatriates website where you can sell your sofas. I put it, I took pictures, I put it, I put my pictures back up there and I was like, I hadn't, closed my law practice. By the way, I had a very lucrative immigration law practice. Big corner office. So sometimes it's the comfort that we must decide to leave. You know, sometimes it's hard to leave when you're comfortable. So I decided I'm gonna sell my chairs, get tickets for the three of us, me and my two girls, and we are gonna get out of here. And then I saw a newspaper thing that a Sunday, like a week, to go and it was saying different, I was seeing speakers for different counties, assemblies, and they all seemed to be lawyers. And because my background was in law, I was like, why not try? But I was a bit also scared, because I was like, now if you fail twice, it kind of kills your morale. Yeah, but I decided, why not try? Even if I fail, now I know, no, no, I close the Kenya chapter, Kabisa, and now go become an American, you know? But uh, anyway, it worked out. I ended up being, making speaker, ended up, becoming a senator five years later, and His Excellency, who is a great supporter of the female gender too. Can we just have a clap for him? Because of him, and I'll say it out here today, because of him, I'm not even looking at him, I, was, I became the chief whip of the Senate of Kenya. But obviously, uh, and ceremoniously, and by the way, the point of divergence, uh, the reason we are here and not where we should have been. On a very practical example, the Prime Minister of the UK is Boris Johnson, right? Can you imagine Boris Johnson campaigning day and night for the party leader of Labour, the leader of opposition, Star? Is that even possible? Can you even see that in anywhere? Has that ever been done anywhere? So when I stand there and I say I will not do this nonsense. I will not support who you are telling us to support because I did not carry my kids across the seas and come all this way to come and leave my brain behind. <laughs> yeah? So we stand for something and finally, we stand for something. And that is why we are here. You have heard our party leader, 
our candidate for president. You have heard the vision that he has for Kenya. He didn't come here and just tell you Tibi Mtialala. Yeah? He told you what he's going to do once he sits there. I don't know how many of you saw as I sit. An ad that was placed by Hillary Clinton when she was running for president. And it had a red phone on it and said, if the phone rings at three in the morning when the children are sleeping and everybody is asleep and the, the phone rings at 3 a.m., who do you want picking that phone up in such a difficult world right now? Who is proven? Who is tested? Who is able to carry on, get in that office, get in those shoes and immediately be able to get Kenya to the next place? Yeah. So, in conclusion, I ask you and I've heard what you have said about the diaspora issue, I totally understand. I totally understand. And especially on the dual citizenship, yes, because, you know, there was that issue of maybe perhaps you, your allegiance may not be to Kenya, perhaps, or maybe there is inherent conflict of interest, perhaps. But I also think both when time comes, because I know God will give us this, because he knows we have a plan for Kenya, we need to revisit that. There are things that need to be revisited so that we can make it easier for those in the diaspora. So thank you very much. And for those of you from Nakuru, oh, Mukowengi, Janet, yeah, you're in Molo, yeah? Yeah. So I'm also asking that if you talk to your relatives, and when you, when you know here you don't only vote for the president, but Pia Munezani's idea when you talk to your relatives, Museme, Governor Nimam around here. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much. Let me ask Kipchumba Murkomen. Um, Your Excellency, sir, um, uh, the Kenyan family in the UK. Uh, good evening. Buona sifiwe. Eh, mume kuja kwa wingi sana. And uh, you look very well, very good, very UDA. More than this, those of us who've come from Kenya. <laughs> and um, I want to thank all of you for hosting us and for coming to welcome His Excellency, the Deputy President. Um, I actually came late because uh, my flight arrived late. And then I went to the room to pretend to prepare myself. Then I slept. <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized it was... Uh, so I called one of my colleagues and asked, is he still there? I said, ah, the DP has just started speaking. Come running. I said, even if I get the last five minutes, I'll be more than happy to, to, to meet you and see you, see your faces. Because I see you online all the time. And the support you give us, I want to say thank you very much. May God bless you. Um, the DP, uh, I met Leo Kidogo. I'm a seminary, I was not there for donkey years. Uh, but I'd like Susan, I'm not complaining. I was in the US for a short period of time, and um, some of the things that I know about diaspora is what I learned as a student when I was in America, and uh, the commitment, the effort, the hard work of Kenyans li living outside the country must always be appreciated. And let's remember, let's not forget, because many people forget back home, let's never forget that we've sent some of our best, most hardworking, most educated sons and daughters out of the country. And we did so with a purpose, because we believed that when they go get good education, it's for the betterment of our country. Then we fail to provide infrastructure that enables them to make that country better. And um, even though I have been in parliament now for nine years, I was made uh, properly, um, I really understood the challenges you are going through even better with the presentation that we had from the, the US team, uh, because they were making it on behalf of the entire uh, uh, diaspora. And even when I was coming here, I was listening to your presentation, it's the same issues. And I believe, like I said to them, that it is time now we provide mechanisms, structures within government. As the deputy president promises in his government to have a ministry of diaspora, those of us who will be also in the legislature must now provide a committee of diaspora so that its work will be to oversight the work of the government on matters related to diaspora of the executive. And I say this, 
let's, let's, you know, many Kenyans think if you talk about Kenyans in diaspora, it is equivalent to foreign affairs issues. Foreign affairs issues is dealing with other countries, you know, and dealing with affairs of nations and international law issues that bring countries together. We are talking here about our own citizens, our own people, yeah, who are... So that is why I appreciate what the DP is saying, that it must be given its own independent uh, and proper uh, management outside the usual issues of foreign affairs, so that the Minister of Foreign Affairs will have a diaspora person. Uh, the, 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 no, no. The Minister of Diaspora will have their diaspora attaché at the embassy. That is his work, that the work of the attaché is fully to focus on diaspora issues. Then the other issues of immigration, trade, and all that will be dealt with by the other attaches in the various uh, embassies. I also want to say here that I have been informed by some of you who live in diaspora that some who became, uh, who, who lost their citizenship before the 2010 constitution are still struggling to get back their citizenship because uh, the regulations say that unless the cabinet secretary signs uh, uh, for you to, to get back your passport, uh, you, may not be, you may not be able to get back. I think that is an issue that we need, we will go back home and relook at it so that it goes back to the di director general of uh, immigration and it's handled with all other immigration issues so that you don't have to create this bureaucracy of the big man having to sign your whatever and before you reach him to sign your documentation, uh, you know the, what happens in between, yeah? Uh, you have to greet him and kneel before him and use an agent and a cousin and all that. We want to reduce that bureaucracy so that we deal with the issue of corruption. Otherwise, I want to say I thank you, uh, people of UK. We love you. We support you. We will do a better job. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I just the DP made me learn that in the Senate, we are too many who have lived out of the country. Uh, Susan, for the two or three years, she has said, although the D <laughs> uh, because I don't want to say the DP is right. <laughs> We have Senator Olekina over 20 years, Senator Malakai Turkana over 30 years. Uh, so it is possible to live here and still come and make contribution back home. I think the issue we just need to deal with is whether a certain cadre of leaders, uh, MCA and MP, uh, even if you have a citizenship of another country, should be allowed to, to serve. And then like many countries in the world, just say, for president, you must not have a citizenship of another country. Because it doesn't stop people coming to serve the way the others have come to serve, just by virtue of having gained the citizenship of another country. Thank you very much. Namungu Wabariki. Yes, we have a, a gentleman here called Robo. Just one minute, Robo. Uh, I'm Jambo. Mimi naitwa Robo, MCA from Mandera. Pia ni... aspired a member of parliament for Kamakunji, Nairobi. Number one, I want to thank the diaspora team who have made their time to be here today. Number two, I want to thank His Excellency, the Deputy President, who is very busy, who went around the US and uh, to UK using his private money so that he can able to listen to the people who are living in diaspora so that when he is making his manifestos, I think you are aware on 15th of March, we are having the National Delegate Conference for, for uh, UDA, whereby we will endorse our deputy president to be our presidential candidate. And finally, that at that time, the deputy president, when he's going around, he is trying to get what is called public participation, especially the diaspora Kenyans who are not living in, in, in Kenya, so that when he's doing his manifesto, he can be able to merge uh, what other Kenyans who are living in diaspora and the other Kenyans who are living in Kenya, so that this issue of how to build one nation and one country to be together at his manifesto. Thank you very much, God bless you.
we ask uh, Governor Mburia, Salim Mburia, the Salim. governor of Kwale. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency, and uh, uh, the leadership of Diaspora. Good evening. Buana Sifiwe. Assalamu alaikum. I'm really humbled, Your Excellency, because um, it's a humbling experience to be here in the UK and to feel at home the way I have felt. Because, in fact, uh, you could mistake this for an NDC. You can see the UDA colors are all over. And I think this is in good spirit. I'm really inspired. And what I want to say is that with the deputy president, we have a leader. I have been on the other side. I was elected 2013 on ODM ticket. Uh, so I worked uh, with the other competitor and uh, famously to catch up with Viboko Mbilimbili. <laughs> so I'm very much aware. 2017, I moved to Jubilee and we have really worked together with the DP. If you want to know a leader who, who means what he says, is a leader who is very specific. For most politicians, they would borrow heavy words like liberation, like Mandela moment, <laughs> and you can't hold them to account. If you vote a candidate based on Mandela moment, what will you ask them when they fail to deliver? <laughs> If you elect a candidate who is telling you, we are now doing a third liberation. You know, I have been here before because I'm an alumni of uh, the IDS Institute here at the University of Sussex. I left here in 2011. And actually, 2011, I made my declaration to run for governor in Brighton. So, so in IDS, as development students, we had a corner which you said glossary of development vocabulary. In that corner, all the words are new words. Now we have new word which we put in the corner, which is called passion. Liberation is there. Governance is there. So most of our politicians have been picking the vocabulary is there without any definite, specific areas that you can hold them to account. When you listen to Dr. William Ruto, you are very specific. We want to deal with the economy. We want to lift the standards of living of our people. And I think that is where we should be voting. Eh, to Zahao Ile Mambongine. And by the way, we have no crisis to unite our people. The crisis we have is that of the economy. So, there's no crisis. It is part of the glossary we will put at the corner. Uh, general words which you can't help people to account. For the first time in our history, we have a leader who is coming to talk to you to ask for your priorities. I'm sure those who have spoken before you were already in the city. Sindio, those who met diaspora, they were already presidents, so they did not have the inspiration to address your issues. But here we have a leader who has come to us, and not just here, all the 47 counties, to discuss specific priorities. I urge you, and I already, I can see you already converted. You have promised 700 votes. I want to inspire you to inspire those who are at home to vote for Dr. William Ruto, to vote for UDA, to vote for Kenya Kwanza, so that we form government. Uh, lastly, Chairman, you know there are also very specific uh, opportunities in counties because part of our plan 
uh, in UDA and Kenya Kwanza is to make sure that we profile the priorities in county governments. So investments can be very specific. The bottom-up economic model can also be specific to counties. So as you prioritize your investment, I think it would be important that you also see what is available in the counties and then you can be able to invest. Otherwise, nime fry sana. Nime fry tena zaidi. Na fry yangu kubwa ni kukutana na uyu mwishimiwa kangete ambaye nimekuwa tukisoma kwa gazeti kwamba ni kansela upande huu. Pale Brighton nilifanya kazi na makansela sana wakati nikifanya utafiti na mambo ya hii ya e, kuhusisha wananchi. Kwa hivyo nikafurai sana kwamba ulichaguliwa. Kwa hivyo mimi sina mengi na waomba sana hii ndiyo serikali na serikali hii haitaundwa tunaiunda pamoja. Tunaiunda pamoja na ndiyo maana maswala haya yote ambayo yamezungumzwa hapa ni ya kipaumbele. Na ni muhimu na tumehakikishiwa na kiongozi wetu yatashughulikiwa. Kule kwingine bado ni hadithi ya Bunuasi. Na wale wanafanya hadithi bado ni wa Kenya. Watapata jukumu mwingine ya kuzungumza na watoto wetu. Lakini mambo ya uongozi wa inchi tumuunge mkono mheshimiwa Ruto aunde serikali na Kenya iende mbele. Asanteni sana. Thank you very much. Let me ask our dear sister Anne Waiguru, the governor of Kirinyaga. <clears throat> Your Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya and the Vice President of the Republic of Kenya, I said, sorry, Your Excellency, the, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya and the fifth President of the Republic of Kenya. <laughs> you know, um, all protocols observed. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. You know, I'm a bit distracted because I have some neighbors there who I was sitting next to, and I wouldn't mention. But when um, <clears throat> the deputy president was speaking, and then when uh, my colleague was speaking, I wouldn't say who said what, but they reminded me that in Koko, your team is reggae. Lakini ninawambia, you know, Niliokoka. <laughs> you know, even the Bible speaks about those people who came. Kuna wale walianza saa kuna ambili ya subui. Kuna wale waliandikuwa saa nne. Kuna wale waliandikuwa saa sita. Na bado kuna time ya wale watakuja saa tisa. Sindio? Na wengine saa kumi. Mwishoe mshara ni ule ule. <laughs> Kuchangulia siyo kufaya nini? Mbora ufike. Then I'm, I'm trying very hard not to look at that time because there was quite a number of things they said. <laughs> Which um, have made my day. I've actually even requested Mulkomen to walk out so I'm able to talk. <laughs> we have a problem. And you have heard from the deputy president that we have a problem in Kenya. We have a problem with a regime that puts itself above the Constitution and the law many times. And we are not just saying it because we're on this side of the divide. There is evidence by the fact that there is over 300 court orders or more against that government. That tells you they've tried to do things that are in violation of the Constitution. Sometimes that regime puts itself even above or in the place of God. They want to decide who becomes what. Wewe, Chukachini, Wewe Mameyako Ninani, Rudi Hivi, 
you, we don't know you, you can't go there, even to the extent, even if they don't say it directly, to say that the deputy president doesn't qualify to be the president of Kenya because he does not come from a certain pedigree. That is putting yourself in the place of God. And we have refused to associate ourselves with that side. And we went to the side of hope and the side of God. That is what we believe. So we are not here just because you've heard what the deputy president has said himself. He has a plan for Kenya. He doesn't just tell you, back me. He tells you why you should back him. And I don't believe that there's anybody who's going to walk out today unconvinced that this man deserves to be given the opportunity to lead the country as the fifth president of the Republic of Kenya. Now, from an economic perspective, so that I don't talk for long, and um, I know he has talked about the bottom-up economic model. There could be people here who have studied economics. <clears throat> but the bottom-up economic model is actually as an economic scientific model that will result in economic growth. If you want to grow an economy, you have two options. And I th think I've said this before, maybe some of you have heard me say it. You can intervene on the fiscal side of the economy, or you can intervene on the monetary side. Now, on the monetary side, you deal with issues of money supply and issues such as the exchange rate. Now you have heard, we don't have any money. That is why we don't save. So you cannot actually intervene on that side. The opportunity does not arise. You can't actually touch, we don't have money supply at this point in time. Now on the fiscal side, <clears throat> you have two choices. You can go and tweak with the tax issues, play around with the taxes, increase, decrease here and there, and then you'll be able to expand the economy depending on the interventions that you make. You already know that Kenyans are overtaxed. Right now, the deputy president cannot say he's going to run for the seat of the president and say, well, I'm going to grow this economy by increasing your taxes. Kenyans, wherever they are, they want their taxes reduced. So the only other option left is actually on the expenditure side, which is really now what he's telling you is the bottom-up economic model. If you invest the amount of resources that you had that will be invested in the lower part of the economy, the economy of Kenya will grow roughly in the first year. And I'm speaking from experience and I'll tell you why. By about minimum of five to six, roughly, first year. If he puts that 100 billion in SMEs and puts the 50 billion, wherever it is he has said, in housing and all that, you will find economic growth in the first year over five. By the second and third, we will be at probably eight or nine percent. And I'll tell you, because when I was in Treasury, I was the head of the economic stimulus program. And the economic stimulus program that actually turned our economy from a negative two growth rate to eight percent during Kibaki's time. And that time we only invested 25 billion, 25 billion shillings only into the economy. We pushed it at the bottom and that's the impact that we got. Everybody talks about President Kibaki turning around the economy. So we are here because we believe it. We have seen the program he has given us. He has talked to us. You have heard he understands it himself. It's not just theory. And we believe that this will be, uh, will bring hope to very many Kenyans. 80% of Kenyans are way below the poverty line. On the issue of um, the programs of the bottom-up, in Kirinyaga, 
You have heard about the things that we're doing because things are being imported. In Kirinyaga, we have a program called Wezesha Kirinyaga. And I'll just say one minute, one thing about Wezesha Kirinyaga. It's a bottom-up economic model. Why is it a bottom-up economic model? We look for farmers to empower them because they do not have that credit. They cannot borrow. And if they borrow, they can't pay. We provide them with resources to be able to put up a program for poultry. And so we get a group of 10, and we give them 1,250 chicks, and we provide them with feeds for six months, and we build the chicken house for them so that they can produce eggs. And in Kirinyaga, we're now producing about a million, we're now heading to two million eggs on that program um, I, 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 yeah, a month. Why did we do that? We did it because one day, I was reading the newspapers, and somebody said that we're importing 10 million eggs from Uganda every month. Why would Kenyans be importing eggs? This is the same concept of the bot. So if you don't think it can work, it can actually work. All those people in that program have increased their income by about 1,000 shillings each per day. 1,000 shillings each per day for a farmer translates to about an extra 30,000 shillings a month on just one program. And these are people who did not have that income at all. So imagine you have a poultry line, then you have a dairy, and we're also doing the AI where we have, I mean, the, the dairy um, intervention where we are increasing the production of milk in Kirinyaga from five liters to 15 liters by again ensuring that we're getting, giving proper feeds, but also improving the breed that uh, we are give, we're giving out to our farmers. So it can be done. It's not theory, and it is really, really for the country of Kenya, something that would bring us a lot of hope. This is the only thing I, I would say. I've been on this side mostly because of loyalty, but then your conscience also can pull you to the other side because of reason and because of hope. This country of Kenya, where we are at, the way it is at is unsustainable. You cannot sustain the country of Kenya the way it is today. Having the four richest people controlling over 80% of the resources in that country, it cannot work. It's not sustainable. And even if you manage to threaten, push people, arrest, it will reach a point that it will break. So we must find a solution for our country. And the solution for our country, at this point in time, I'm not only persuaded, I am convinced and I'm convicted that that solution lies with William Samoe Ruto. <laughs> so I think what we may ask for you Everybody has talked about the things that you've requested for and the things that you'll be given, so I will not go there. I know that you've already committed, Your Excellency, to give them a ministry that deals with their issues. I think what we will ask, let me also be on this side asking the diaspora. Niwaombe, ama niwaulize. This party, we will not win by just sitting and talking to ourselves in echo chambers. We stand a very good chance of winning. In fact, I'm coming short of saying we will win by the grace of God. I think we all need to play our part. You need to play a part also. Diaspora is most likely to, going to be voting. We have very many people in diaspora, here and in other countries. You are the voices that can reach them, explain to them, convince them, and bring them to our side so that we ensure that in diaspora, nine, over 90%, in fact, if possible, 95% of the votes come to this side of UDA Kenya Kwanzaa. That is a request. For you to do that, you'd have to give of your time you would have to give of your resources. You would have to drive to somebody's home. 
you'd need to speak to your people at home also. Maybe even support the party or the local chapter. That is really what, on behalf of the team, because we have also given quite a bit, make a slight request. And because I had there are very many um, preachers in the room, I don't know whether anyone knows what, I think it's 2 Corinthians 8, 7 says. I will, I know, and just as you exhale, and just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. God bless you. Thank you very much, Anne. Let me ask, finally, uh, Governor of Turkana, uh, John Nanok. Asante ni sana. Bwana asifiwe. Bwana asifiwe. Salam alaikum. Asante sana. I, Your Excellency, I appreciate being here and to address our fellow citizens out here in the UK. Um, this is great. And I think after the Deputy President has spoken, there is very little we can really say because we believe in what he has said. I serve two roles. One is, as the Governor of Trukana, I'm concluding my term. I've only had five, five months to finish up, and I'm not uh, refusing with a seat. Neither am I forcing it on to the people of Turkana, like what some people are trying to do. But I'm also serving as uh, the head of uh, uh, William Ruto's uh, presidential campaign. <laughs> and we have a big team. It's not a small team. It's a team of competent professionals that is working with him for quite some time now. I think from that moment you heard that uh, the media back home, the bias media was saying, Ruto has no plan. He's just, uh, this is just uh, political gimmicks. I think they didn't know what they, were, what they were saying because that plan was there. And indeed, uh, you have just enriched that plan. Because as constituent or county number 48, you have given your views of what you think are priorities, and these are views that are going to be to inform the charter you are going to sign with the deputy president. I believe uh, very early in April, you will have to sign that charter, April or May, along with all the other 47 counties who are currently engaging in discussion to set their business plan and the priorities. So it's a completely different, and, and this hasn't been done this way before in Kenya. This is the first time that people can actually be told, tell us the solutions to the problem you are facing, and government will invest into those solutions. Government will prioritize and put resources into that. And I want to, to thank my colleague, uh, Governor Waiguru, for emphasizing what the bottom-up is on how we will grow ourselves out of debt through the bottom up, how we'll grow ourselves out of poverty. And, and that is a major plan. When you hear a competitor, actually I served for almost uh, 10 years or 12 years with Raila Odinga. I was, I was his vice chair in the party. And I think Owen Bayer was the deputy organizing secretary then. But we left because we did not see a plan. We did not see our int the interest of the people were not being served. It was just a story, a story, a story. At the end of the day, very good manifestos are being put aside and other things are begun. But here we have that plan, the bottom up, and it is a strong plan. It is detailed. It is going to refocus the government of Kenya 
to be more aggressive in commercial diplomacy. And I know many of you are here, not only sending money, but you want to position yourselves as to take advantage of investments out here and back home. And I think that is going to be the aggressiveness that bottom-up economic plan is going to be emphasizing. A critical component which your chair and secretary general have spoken into is about the constitution. I saw you quoting quite a number of articles in the Bill of Rights and other sections saying, this one gives us this right, it's not been affected. UDA, through presidential candidate William Ruto, promises to implement the constitution to the letter not to amend the constitution and change it, but to implement it because there are still very good things inside. The entire array of Bill of Rights has very good things. The entire array of environment and natural resources, the entire section on devolution, the entire section on financing. I think all those are areas that we will still want to see the benefits being ripped into. And all that can be we can be able to get it through the bottom up. But of course also giving the independent institutions, the judiciary, the IBC, the ESCC, the National Police Service, the independence that the constitution provides them and the resources to be able to deal with issues, matters, rule and law, and corruption. And I think it is so critical we have that commitment. I have not heard that one from uh, Raila. He doesn't talk about that because he doesn't want to commit on anything. And I think just as my, my colleague Mvuria has said, he wants to talk about Mandela moment. Because Mandela moment, for, for a show show in Nakuru, I mean, how can you be accountable to that mama on a Mandela moment? They don't even know what it is. Eh? But at least you can be accountable to say, I will help Mama Mboga get fair credit. I will help uh, the Boda Boda guy get this specific thing. I will help the people in the in diaspora be able to process their documentation eh? within a very short time. You know, that is a commitment. Eh? And I think for you even who are voting and for those others who have undecided, I think you have the opportunity to turn them and tell them, seriously, this is a guy who has a plan and is ready to work for Kenyans wherever. And I can tell you for a fact, we were in the States the last one week, we are here now, the reception has been very positive, even from non-Kenyans. Because they see this is a serious group and this is a serious candidate. So let's stand with him. <laughs> we have five months to election. It is a lot of time. Five months is not... Uh, uh, very few. It's a lot of time. It is also a very short period. How can we be able to make sure that the deputy president becomes the president of Kenya so that what he promises is fulfilled? So that for the first time, millions of Kenyans can directly benefit with money and support from government be able to improve a lot. We have a response all of us, you have a responsibility here in the diaspora. Most critical number one is voting. The 700 of you, I know many of you are not, a number of you also are not voting. So we must vote every man and woman to 100% of that 700. Second, your moral support your financial support to the campaign is going to be very critical. Very, very critical. We have begun a campaign, and I think you'll be seeing, you will be, you'll be seeing updates on the internet and the blog, so that you can follow the youth candidate wherever he goes and wherever he plans. So that will be available. What is he doing tomorrow? What is he doing next month? All that information you'll be getting to the letter as we move forward. We have also been in a campaign of adopting a polling station because we want to protect that vote. First, before we give details, Samuel Ruto 
And the party UDA is promising a fair and free election. He has been on record that he will accept the results of these coming elections. He has been on record that we will not entertain violence among members of UDA. So UDA must be peaceful during this election. And he has also been on record, which a response that has not been provided, that our competitors must publicly commit. They have not yet. As usual, they have not yet, because that is their route of negotiating handshakes. They have not. And we will continue insisting that they make that commitment of agreeing to the results of, any, of, of elections. So it is critical we mobilize the vote. It is critical we protect the vote. I know you have a big following, relatives and friends back home. It is your chance to make sure that those relatives vote where you think results are going to be coming. And for the first time, majority of Kenyans are going to be benefiting. We're beginning a campaign of protecting the vote at the very lowest uh, voting level, the polling center and the polling stations. For your information, we have about 55,000 polling stations, 24,000 polling centers where the vote is going to be cast, the vote is going to be counted. 290 constituencies where both the count and the tallying, including the presidential vote, is going to be done, which will be final. So, so it's critical areas where we must protect the vote. We are telling our competitors, protect your vote. We will protect ours. This is where we, you can be able to make contributions. You can be able to, you can easily adopt your own home polling station or polling center from the village where you come from. You could decide as a group to adopt a ward. You could decide to adopt a constituency or a county. That is your contribution to this campaign that we are looking at. So that the days preceding 9th of August and until the vote is counted, we make sure that we have very good vote protection and we have very few incidences of vote theft. We have also asked the international community and the civil society and the media to make sure that they have deployed as much as possible to all these polling stations, to all the 290 constituency tallying centers, so that at least they can help us be able to relay accurate information and to confirm the results that IBC will be announcing in those stations. Kwaivo, we have a very big journey to work together. If we have to see the benefits of what we've been told, and I believe that all the issues you've raised here on the diaspora are doable. So let's work together to make sure that they are realized under this presidency. And I can tell you, Raila will be following us here. He will follow us here because he, he has no agenda. He will follow us here, he will tell you, he'll fix the economy, he will do this, but listen to him keenly. There will be no commitment, you'll make specific commitment. So thank you, Your Excellency. I know that uh, you will win this election. We know you will win, but these five months, we must make, get a win of 70%. Asante Nizana. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor Nanok.